My name is Kieran Jones, and this happened to me on July 22, 2019. Sounds like a cheesy horror movie start, huh? It wasn't cheesy then. Trust me. I grew up in a middle-class suburb where Friday nights meant football games, not chasing things in the woods. After college, I stumbled into the CIA, more out of boredom than patriotic zeal, I'll admit. Then two years back, I was offered a transfer. Nothing too glamorous, mind you, a new unit investigating unusual crimes and occurrences in remote areas. Cases the Bureau didn't want, couldn't explain, or didn't want to admit were happening at all. My first assignment, a series of mysterious disappearances in the Allegheny National Forest in Pennsylvania. Locals whispered about an old legend called Moss Man, but I scoffed. Still, disappearances were real, and that meant it was my job to check it out. I'm not the type to jump at shadows, but the Alleghenies are primeval. Dense, tangled woods that seem to swallow sunlight. The silence was worse, no birdsong, no rustling of small critters. It felt empty. I spent a week on my own, scouting trails, setting up cameras, questioning locals in nearby towns. Nothing. No clues, no fresh leads. Just the same rumors that had been swirling for decades. The locals looked at me like I was either crazy or wasting my time chasing fairy tales. I couldn't blame them, honestly. Then came the break. Ranger Station called. They found a hiker, or what was left of one. Gruesome doesn't cover it. I don't want to describe what the body looked like. You get the idea? The worst part? No sign of how it happened. No animal tracks, no indication of a struggle, just parts missing. That was enough to call in the rest of my unit. We arrived three days later. Jensen, our forensics expert, Dr. Patel, behavioral analysis, and me, the lucky schmuck stuck in the woods holding the bag. We had our gear, the works, satellite phones, drones, motion sensors. But against whatever did that, we might as well have been armed with flashlights. We set up camp at the site of the incident. The atmosphere was tense. This wasn't a regular investigation. There was something heavy in the air, a sense of being watched. I told myself it was just the isolation, playing tricks. The night we set up the sensor array was when things took a turn. I was on watch, 2 a.m., and those motion sensors lit up like a Christmas tree, all at once, all in a sector of forest deeper in. The rest of the team scrambled out of the tent. Jensen was radioing in a sitrep when I saw it. Something moved through the trees, just a flash in the infrared. Tall, lanky, wrong. It was gone in a second, but I knew, everyone knew, it was out there. Dr. Patel, bless her, wanted to analyze this thing, understand it. Me, I wanted it in a body bag. We geared up, loaded our weapons, and ventured into the trees. Night vision flickered green, highlighting every branch and twisted root ready to trip us up. We followed the sensor trail. They led us deeper and deeper. The silence was oppressive now, absolute. I could hear the pounding of my own heart in my ears. That's when we found the clearing. It was like a bomb had gone off. Trees clawed at the sky, their branches snapped and broken. The forest floor was a churned-up mess of mud and leaves. Something big had been here, fought here, maybe died here, but there was no obvious body or blood. Jensen started doing his thing, scanning the area, swabbing sap off branches. I heard a growl behind me. A low, guttural rumble that raised every hair on my body. I spun, gun raised, searching the darkness. 
There it was, crouched on a gnarled tree trunk. Red eyes glared through the darkness, unblinking, filled with a cold, predatory hunger. The form was monstrous, a lanky, twisted distortion of a human shape. Its skin was bark-like, mottled with moss, making it blend seamlessly with the shadows. Its limbs were too long, its fingers tipped with claws that sparked against the tree. My training kicked in. I fired center mass. The creature hissed, a chilling sound that sliced through the night and dropped from the tree into the darkness. The clearing erupted in chaos. Our backup lights cut on, flooding the area with harsh white light. We spread out, searching, weapons sweeping back and forth. But the creature was gone, vanished like a shadow. The rest of the night was tense and sleepless. Morning revealed no further signs of the creature. No blood, no hair, nothing. All we had were impressions of its monstrous form burned into our retinas and the lingering feeling of being hunted. We spent hours scouring the clearing, collecting every shred of possible evidence, but the forest yielded none of its secrets. When we finally trudged back to base camp, a grim silence hung over our team. The incident sent shockwaves through the unit, the higher-ups, the whole bureau. There were debriefings, medical exams, psych evals, the whole nine yards. It became clear no one had any answers for what we'd seen out there. Jensen's analysis yielded bizarre results traces of unknown organic compounds, plant fibers fused in a way that shouldn't occur in nature. Dr. Patel's behavioral profile amounted to the stuff of nightmares, a creature exhibiting hyperintelligence, a predator evolved for stealth and ambush, possibly something entirely novel to science. I just kept seeing those red eyes, the flicker of claws in the dim light. They asked me what I wanted to do, report and with a cover story, stay on the case. Hell, I could have walked away with a hefty severance check and a lifetime supply of sleep meds. But how could I? The creature was still out there, and what we'd seen, it wasn't just some animal attack, not in the way people understood the word animal. We went back to the Alleghenies, this time with reinforcements. A full tactical squad, biologists, trackers specializing in big game. We turned those woods upside down. They spread out in grids, set up camera traps, thermal imaging, even flew drones at night. I joined the search parties, nerves taut, waiting for the familiar red eyes to glint from the darkness. The days felt endless, a grinding routine of false alarms and mounting dread. The locals, they knew something was up. The disappearances stopped but the tension in those backwoods towns went nuclear. They looked at us like we brought the monster with us. Couldn't blame them. We'd stirred the hornet's nest, and now the whole damn forest buzzed in anticipation. Then, two weeks into the expanded search, the breakthrough happened, but not the way we expected. A group of campers stumbled on a ranger station deep in the woods, abandoned and showing signs of a struggle. No blood, but the place was trashed, equipment scattered. They radioed in, and we descended in force. The ranger station had that same unnatural stillness as the original crime scene. Whatever had passed through here, it wasn't some rogue bear. The missing ranger's rifle was on the ground, warped like a pretzel. Claw marks gouged the walls, too deep for anything I could identify. I felt a cold dread settling in. This, this was getting personal. Our trackers found a trail. I followed, along with a seasoned tactical agent named Carter. The prints weren't animal, weren't human. They looked more like the gnarled roots of some old tree had come unstuck and taken a walk. They led us deeper, straight toward the heart of the forest, where sunlight barely dared to penetrate. We stopped for the night at the edge of a ravine, too steep and overgrown to cross in fading light. 
Carter and I hunkered down in a thicket, our night vision flickering green as we scanned the gloom. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was a setup, that the creature was drawing us in. That's when I heard it, the crackle of a branch, barely audible above the rustling leaves. I motioned to Carter, adrenaline pumping. He held up a fist, the universal sign to halt. This thing was smart, it might be toying with us, trying to pick us off one by one. Moments later, a shadow flickered across our night vision. It was crouched up above, on the rim of the ravine, too well hidden for a clear shot. Carter whispered, I'll flank you hold and engage. I nodded, my heart pounding a deafening rhythm in my ears. He melted into the undergrowth, silent as a ghost. I waited, finger on the trigger, aimed at the spot where the creature had been. But it had vanished. Then came the scream. A gut-wrenching, blood-curdling scream that cut through the night. It came from the direction Carter had gone. He was good, damn good, but this thing, it was in its element. I scrambled to my feet, scanning the ravine rim frantically. A flash of movement between the trees. I fired a burst, saw a dark shape flinch back, heard a startled hiss. I charged forward, not thinking, just following the trail of screams and broken branches. The scene was out of a nightmare. Carter lay broken among twisted roots. The creature was over him. Even in the dim green light, I saw the horror of it all. Carter's body, so strong and capable moments ago, now ragged all limp, his throat a gaping wound. And the creature, it was changing. Shifting, growing, taking bits of its surroundings, bark and leaves, and molding them onto itself. Its eyes glowed with a sick triumph. My shots hit it, but they didn't seem to phase it. I backed away, firing wildly, stumbling over the uneven ground. It lunged, and I fell, my vision filled with its clawed hand reaching for my face. I squeezed my eyes shut, awaiting the end. But there was no pain, no tearing of flesh. Only a deafening blast that shook the forest floor and a flash of blinding light. I opened my eyes. The creature was gone, vanished in a haze of smoke and charred leaves. Above the canopy of trees, helicopters roared. Backup was here, drawn by the firefight. They airlifted me out, along with Carter's body. The tactical officers who found me said I was babbling, incoherent, my eyes filled with a terror they couldn't comprehend. They patted me on the shoulder, told me I was a hero, fed me some line about. Unknown animal attack. I didn't argue. I knew what I saw. They wouldn't believe it anyway. The months following were a blur. Debriefings, doctors, endless reports that would be buried in some classified vault. They gave me a medal. They gave me a generous leave of absence. It was a slap in the face masquerading as kindness. The higher-ups wanted the whole nightmare swept under the rug. Easier to bury the truth than acknowledge the unexplainable. My nights were haunted by red eyes and Carter's last scream. The day he died, something inside me died with him. I drank too much, slept too little, and when my leave ended, I didn't go back. Couldn't stomach the lies, the pretense of normalcy. I handed in my resignation, cut off all contact with my old unit. Figured they'd be happier pretending I never existed. I drifted for a while, trying to fill the emptiness inside me. Moved to a different state, a remote cabin nestled on the edge of a national park, mountains this time, not woods. I figured if it came for me, at least I'd see it coming across the open meadows. The peace was a lie. Nightmares clung to me, and I'd wake sweating and trembling, convinced the thing lurked in the shadows of my cabin. I started arming myself, gun by the bed, 
heavy-duty locks on the doors. It helped some chase the hollow feeling back, but not for long. One day, I got a letter. No return address, just my name typed on a plain envelope. Inside, a single news clipping from a small Pennsylvanian paper. The article detailed a rash of unsolved murders in the Allegheny National Forest. Hikers, rangers, locals, bodies torn apart, the same gruesome signature we'd seen years ago. Below the article, a handwritten note, scrawled in shaky letters. It knows where you are. It hasn't forgotten. My stomach churned. Had it followed me? Was it just biding its time? Or worse, had I inadvertently directed it to a new hunting ground, doomed those innocent people? The guilt ate at me, a parasite burrowing deeper each day. I started making plans. Not to run, not anymore. This thing, it needed to be stopped. I knew the cost of fighting it, the lives it had already claimed. But I also knew if I did nothing, more would die. I couldn't live with that. I reached out to my few remaining contacts in the Bureau, folks I knew wouldn't dismiss my story as the ravings of a broken man. Turns out, there were others like me, agents who'd seen the darkness at the edge of reality and survived. We formed a loose alliance, a ragtag group bound by shared trauma and a desperate hope. We pooled our resources, our knowledge, everything we had. There was no official backing, no government sanction for this mission. It was just us against the unknown. But for the first time in years, I felt something flicker to life within me, not fear, not resignation, but a grim determination. The old me, the cocky analyst who thought he could handle anything, is gone. In his place is a scarred veteran forged in shadows. The hunt has become my life. We track the creature, trace the patterns of its kills, set traps, gather whatever intel we can scrape up. Most of the time we hit dead ends, but there's always that glimmer of hope that with the next clue, the next lead, we'll be one step closer to confronting it again. The stakes are always personal. Every mutilated body we find, every missing person report, fuels the rage and sorrow that drives us. We know what's out there, hunting in the wild places, preying on those unlucky enough to cross its path. We know it's only a matter of time before the hunters become the hunted once more. I don't know how this ends. Will we end this nightmare or become just more casualties in a secret war? Maybe there is no victory against something like this, just survival day by day. But sometimes, late at night, I imagine Carter there beside me. I see the determined glint in his eyes, and I remember why I fight. We have no choice. We are the thin line between the world of light and the shadowed corners where unspeakable things lurk. And if we fail, God help us all. My name is Declan Murphy, and this happened to me on February 27, 2017. Sounds like the start of some cheesy B-movie horror, doesn't it? Trust me, it was far from cheesy. I always thought of myself as a normal guy. Ex-Army, now a desk jockey for the CIA, nothing too flashy. Then, a transfer offer came my way a small unit created for unusual cases in remote areas. It wasn't Area 51 stuff, more like Bigfoot sightings crossed with unexplained disappearances the kind of cases you read about in those bizarre internet rabbit holes. I figured, why not? Nothing wrong with a bit of adventure after years of pushing paperwork. My first assignment, Olympic National Park, Washington State. A lush, majestic rainforest, the kind of place you see on nature documentaries and think, Damn, America has it all. 
The assignment, however, was far less majestic. A rash of disappearances over several years, hikers and park rangers vanishing without a trace. No bodies, no evidence, just gone. The local cops were stumped, so they figured, why not call in the folks who might believe some weirder possibilities? I spent weeks combing through the park. There was the usual stuff, animal attack theories, disgruntled loner with a cabin in the woods, the occasional escaped convict. But nothing fit the pattern. These vanished without a scream, without a sign, no blood, no struggle. That gnawing unease crept in the feeling that this wasn't a regular missing person case. With the help of a local ranger named Anya, tough, sharp, with eyes that seemed to see a bit too much of the forest, we zeroed in on an area with the highest concentration of disappearances, a deep and ancient part of the woods tourists rarely ventured into. The day it happened, we were setting up a sensor grid that would alert us to any movement larger than a squirrel. Mid set up, Anya tensed, her hand on the rifle at her side. I knew that look it said the hunter had become the hunted. I readied myself, senses on high alert. Nothing disturbed the eerie silence. Not even bird song. The sensor grid started pinging, a series of rapid, erratic flashes. Whatever was out there, it was big, fast, and weaving a strange, unpredictable path through the dense undergrowth. We grabbed our gear and headed toward the source of the signal, weapons drawn. My heart hammered against my ribs, but the ingrained training kicked in. Focus, precision, those beat back the fear. We followed the trail of broken branches and trampled ferns. It didn't move like an animal, or a human for that matter. It was too agile, too erratic. Anya and I communicated in silent hand signals, splitting off to try and flank the thing. Then, the forest exploded with movement. A flash of dark against the green. It blurred past me, just a suggestion of a shape. Tall, impossibly slender, limbs impossibly long. I fired, but the shot went wide. Anya shouted, a sharp cry cut short by a chilling hiss. I sprinted toward the sound, pushing through the thick undergrowth. Anya lay pinned beneath a fallen log, blood soaking into the ferns. And above her towered the creature. It was immense, nearly eight feet tall, its form shrouded in swirling patches of moss and bark that mimicked the texture of its surroundings. Its fingers were like gnarled branches tipped with claws that sparked against the tree. Its face, it had a face, of sorts— a mask of interwoven twigs and knotted wood contorted into a grotesque parody of human expression. But it was the eyes that haunted me, pits of bottomless yellow, filled with a cold predatory intelligence. Anya screamed, her arm outstretched, fingers scrabbling at the creature's leg. It hissed in response, the sound like steam venting from an ancient machine. In a single, fluid motion, it lifted Anya and tossed her aside like a rag doll. She hit the ground with a sickening thud and lay still. Blind rage surged through me. I raised my weapon and fired, again and again, the deafening blast echoing through the silent forest. The creature screeched, a sound that raised the hairs on the back of my neck. It stumbled back, clutching at its torso. My shots must have hit something vital. I pressed my advantage, running forward, determined to end this. Then the ground beneath me gave way. I tumbled into darkness, the world tilting as I plummeted into a hidden ravine. Pain exploded through my leg as I landed hard, my ankle giving out in a sickening twist. A groan escaped my lips. There was movement above, the rustling of leaves and the grating sound of bark against rock. The creature was peering down into the ravine, its face a mask of fury. It began to descend, moving with horrifying grace despite its bulk. 
I struggled to rise, my injured leg useless beneath me. My gun was gone, lost in the fall. I was trapped. With a sickening lurch I realized this was how it would end. Not with the heroic last stand, but as another fading scream in the indifferent forest. A desperate surge of adrenaline gave me one last ounce of strength. I fumbled in my pack, fingers shaking, and found what I was looking for a flare. It was meant for signaling, not combat, but it was all I had. I ripped the cap off and struck the flare against a rock, the brilliant magnesium light filling the ravine with a blinding flash. The creature screeched, a piercing sound that set my teeth on edge. It recoiled from the sudden light, shielding its eyes, its moss-covered skin sizzling and smoking slightly. This was my chance. I hobbled and crawled across the rough ground, dragging myself toward an outcropping of moss-laden boulders, a jumbled cluster that might offer the slimmest chance of concealment. Behind me, the creature roared in pain and anger. I heard the crashing of branches and the scraping of bark. It was coming after me, blinded but enraged. The flare in my hand began to sputter and dim, the precious moments leaking away. I dove behind the rocks just as the creature thrashed out of the ravine, clawing at the air where I'd been seconds before. Its movements were uncoordinated now, the pain and the fading light disorienting it. I took a trembling breath, trying to calm my ragged gasps, every instinct screaming at me to run. But I knew that was pointless. This thing, injured or not, could outpace me at full sprint. I needed a new plan, and fast. Then I noticed it. A sliver of sunlight pierced the thick canopy above, filtering through the leaves to illuminate a single thick vine dangling from a massive ancient cedar. My gaze traced the vine upwards. High, possibly too high, but if I could climb it. The creature screeched again, closer this time. My hands closed around the rough vine ignoring the sting of torn skin, and I began to haul myself upward. Fear and desperation lent me a surprising strength. My injured leg throbbed with each movement, but I gritted my teeth and kept climbing. The creature was thrashing around below me, its long limbs swatting at the rocks, blindly searching. A jolt of fear shot through me as a clawed hand snagged at my boot a single jagged nail ripping through the fabric. I kicked out, the force of it tearing my already wounded ankle, sending a lance of pain through me. I climbed higher, faster, my breath ragged in my throat. The sunlight seemed tantalizingly close now, a promise of escape. One final heave, my hands scrambling for a hold, and then I was pulling myself onto a thick sun-warmed branch. Below, the creature finally realized what was happening. It began to climb, its movements surprisingly quick for its immense bulk. But it was too slow, already too far behind. I pulled myself further up, clawing my way towards the canopy, towards safety. The creature reached the base of the cedar and launched itself upward in a terrifying leap. Its clawed fingers brushed the soles of my boots and I cried out. But the momentum was with me. I kicked free, swinging out into space and then scrambling into the dense, protective foliage of the canopy. I lay there gasping on a bed of leaves and moss, the sunlight on my face a blessed relief after the gloom of the forest floor. I heard the creature's frustrated roar echoing through the trees, and then, silence. It was gone. For now. Hours later, I was rescued. A helicopter search team, alerted by the flare, found me tangled high in the branches, shivering and bleeding, but alive. Anya didn't make it. They found her body, broken and mangled, at the base of the ravine. The official report ruled it an animal attack, likely a cougar strayed too deep into the forest. Anyone who saw the creature knew better, 
but there was an unspoken agreement to keep that particular detail off the record. I survived, but at a cost. My ankle never fully healed, a constant reminder of that day in the forest. My nightmares are haunted by Ani's scream and those burning yellow eyes. I left the CIA shortly after. Desk jobs never quite seemed worth it in the grand scheme of things. Now, I work as a private consultant. Cases on the fringe, things people can't explain, don't want to explain. I've teamed up with a handful of others like me, those who've brushed against the darkness and survived. Hunters, scientists, misfits, we're a patchwork crew drawn together by shared trauma and a stubborn refusal to look away. The creature in the Olympic forest, I never learned what it was. Some ancient spirit of the woods, a being from a forgotten time, or a freak of evolution, it didn't matter. What matters is that it's out there. And there might be others like it, lurking in the wild, forgotten corners of the world. We track them. We hunt them. Or perhaps they hunt us. All I know for sure is that the war in the shadows is far from over. The woods are vast, the secrets they hold even vaster, and sometimes, the monsters aren't just stories told around a campfire. Sometimes, they're real, and they're closer than you think. My name is Elias Kane, and this happened to me on October 23, 2020. I was a fresh-faced rookie CIA analyst back then, not a field agent, mind you. But then again, who needs muddy boots when trouble can find you in a cubicle? I'd always been the curious sort, had a knack for patterns and the thrill of uncovering something unseen. It probably landed me on that special projects team, the one they joked was the X-Files with less aliens and more bureaucracy. My first big assignment came innocuously disguised as a data leak. It was in the heart of Yellowstone National Park a geothermal sensor offline, wildlife cams malfunctioning, all in a localized area. Routine stuff, until I dug in. The glitch coincided with a rash of peculiar missing persons reports. Hikers, the adventurous kind, disappearing without a trace. No bodies, no gear, no animal attack signs. The Bureau called it cold cases, an unfortunate reality out in the wilds. But those coincidences itched at me like a mosquito bite you just can't ignore. Weeks later, I was bumping along in a park ranger jeep heading to the problem zone. Alongside me was Zara, a senior ranger with more grit than a gravel road and a gaze that missed nothing. We made an odd pair, the analyst and the toughened outdoors woman. Conversation flowed easy, though. Turns out, we both had a bone to pick with the term. Unsolved. She'd lost a brother years back on a solo camping trip in those same woods. Our destination was a deep valley locals called Owl's End. The old caldera rim was a tangle of cliffs and twisted trees, the kind of place that had more shadows than light even at midday. I set up my gear, a mix of standard tech and a few unofficial gadgets courtesy of the Weird Science Division of the Agency. Zara kept watch, her rifle a comfortingly solid presence against the unsettling silence. It wasn't the silence of nature, though this was a void, an absence of the usual rustlings and birdsong. The first glitch registered at dusk a thermal spike that made no sense. Then, the ground tremor detectors went haywire, readings localized and impossibly strong. Zara swore under her breath, hand tight on her rifle. I knew that look. It said the predators here weren't the four-legged kind. Movement flickered across the screen something big, too fast for cameras to catch cleanly. We shared a look, adrenaline spiking. Whatever was out there, it knew we were watching. 
The game had changed. Night fell like a shroud. I adjusted the sensitivity on our gear, pushing the limits of what those gadgets were meant to detect. And that's when I saw it. An outline on the thermal camera, warped and shifting against the chilled rock and trees. It was immense, nearly nine feet tall, its skeletal limbs impossibly long, camouflaged by patches of earth and foliage clinging to its form. My mind raced, trying to rationalize it, categorize it, and failing spectacularly. Zara must have seen the horror on my face. What is that thing? She breathed voice taut. I don't know. I admitted, the words feeling pathetically inadequate then it charged. Not in the predictable rush of an animal, but in disjointed bursts, moving like a stop-motion animation brought terrifyingly to life. Zara fired, the rifle shots echoing across the valley, but the creature seemed unfazed. It dodged between trees with impossible agility, its elongated limbs snatching at Zara as she scrambled backward. I fumbled for my pack, fishing out a canister with shaking fingers. Flare! I yelled, tossing it at Zara. She dove to the side just as the creature swiped at her, its razor-sharp claws gouging deep furrows into the ground where she'd stood a heartbeat before. She caught the flare, yanked the cap, and struck it against a rock. The magnesium light flared with blinding intensity. The creature reared back, screeching a sound that made my teeth vibrate within my skull. The stench of burning leaves and singed. Something filled the air. Zara scrambled toward me as the creature thrashed in pain, blinded by the sudden light. We ran, stumbling through the trees, guided only by the echoes of our own terror and the enraged screeches behind us. We burst out of the valley and sprinted across a clearing, risking exposure for speed. Suddenly, a tree exploded beside me in a shower of wood and leaves. The creature stood at the edge of the clearing, its silhouette monstrous against the moonlight. But it didn't advance. The flare was already dying, and it seemed unwilling to enter the darkness. Breathing ragged, Zara and I backed away, weapons trained on the motionless figure. Then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, it turned and melted back into the shadows. The adrenaline high crashed hard, replaced by a bone-deep chill. We spent the rest of the night hunkered down in a ranger's hut, taking turns peering out at the darkness that had become infinitely more menacing. I filed an incident report filled with technical jargon designed to both obscure and convey the sheer impossibility of what we'd encountered. Expected it to vanish into the bureaucracy, never to be heard of again. I was wrong. Within a week I was back in D.C., not in my dingy cubicle, but a conference room filled with brass I'd only seen in photos. There was shock on their faces, mirrored in my own. No one laughed at my wild descriptions, my thermal printouts that looked like a child's stick figure drawing come to monstrous life. Instead, I was swept into a world I never knew existed. That task force, the one they joked about? Very real. And they were underfunded, undermanned, and facing the kind of threats that scrambled everything you thought you knew about the natural world. My Yellowstone encounter was just one blip on a terrifyingly vast radar. I learned quickly. They taught me, out of necessity. There wasn't time for textbooks and theories. I was thrust into the field, armed with uprated tech, knowledge I hadn't earned, and an unshakable terror that lurked beneath the surface composure they demanded. Zara joined the team, too her field experience invaluable, her eyes holding a haunted understanding that bonded us beyond words. We became hunters of shadows. The creature in Yellowstone, they assigned it a designation, Wraithwood, based on its mimicry and elusive nature. There were others, given equally chilling names. Each file was a nightmare, 
each mission a step into unknown territory. It wasn't just about capturing these things. Containment was an impossible dream. We tracked patterns, disrupted hunts, and sometimes, just sometimes, bought a victim precious time to escape. The victories were small, the cost high. For every missing hiker we managed to pull back from the brink, there were those we failed. We found bodies, or only fragments, the aftermath of confrontations we were too late to stop. The creature in Yellowstone eluded us, but reports of disappearances kept trickling in. It was learning, adapting, becoming a deadlier predator with each passing season. I saw the toll it took on Zara. It wasn't just the physical scars, but the weight of every life we couldn't save, including her own brother, finally confirmed among the Wraithwood's victims. There was a recklessness building in her a willingness to take risks that made my gut clench with dread. Then came the mission that changed everything. A flurry of reports, a spike in activity. It wasn't the Yellowstone creature this time, but something similar, operating in the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest. We scrambled, a patchwork unit of agents, biologists, and even a grizzled anthropologist who muttered about old legends revived in the worst possible way. I watched Sara gear up, the familiar determination in her eyes now laced with something desperate. We shared a look, a silent acknowledgement that this might be the hunt that broke us. We tracked the creature for days, following a trail of eerily silent forests and the telltale signs of its passing, clawed trees, remnants of what used to be unfortunate hikers. We set up an ambush, an array of tech that felt laughably futile against the primal horror we were facing. We didn't have long to wait. It emerged from the undergrowth, a grotesque parody of nature. This one was bulkier than the Yellowstone Wraithwood, its mottled hide more stone than bark. It moved with a jarring, disjointed fluidity, its eyes pits of darkness fixated on us. It charged. Chaos erupted. Sensors screamed warnings. Lights flashed. Our net trap triggered early, snagging the creature in a tangle of high tensile wires. It roared in fury, the sound shaking the ground beneath our feet. Zara surged forward, driven by some reckless fury firing a specialized round meant to disrupt the creature's camouflage. A single shot, echoing through the forest. Then silence. The creature froze, its form losing cohesion, patches of its form dissolving into smoke and swirling leaves. It let out a strangled, almost plaintive hiss, and then, in a blink, it was simply gone. Vanished without a trace. A stunned silence descended upon the clearing. The relief, the disbelief, was swept away moments later as I realized Zara was missing. We searched frantically, spreading out through the woods, shouting her name. I stumbled upon her rifle, discarded and still warm, in a small hollow. Beyond it, the ground was churned up, littered with scraps of fabric, and blood. So much blood. The emptiness that opened up within me in that moment was worse than any fear I'd faced before. Zara was gone. Swallowed by the forest, taken by the shadows we hunted. They told me to take leave, to process what happened. The words felt hollow. There was no processing this, no analyzing my way out of the guilt and rage. The thing I learned, out there in those dark places— is that the world holds monsters beyond any campfire story. Some battles you don't win, you just survive. I haven't gone back to the task force. I don't know if I ever will. But I haven't turned my back on the darkness either. In seedy bars near trailheads, in online forums whispered about by those with haunted eyes, I seek information, rumors, anything about creatures like those that took Zara. The hunt has become a solitary one, fueled by a relentless need not for vengeance, 
but for some flicker of understanding in a world gone monstrous. The naive analyst that once was is gone, replaced by a man hardened by unseen battles. I've become one of the shadows, driven by the fading memory of a woman who dared to fight them. My name is Rowan Cooper, and this happened to me on March 5, 2021. I was a green recruit at the CIA then, fresh off an analyst's desk and hungry to prove I could handle fieldwork. Sure, I had the wilderness survival training, but that's as choreographed as a ballet compared to the messy reality of the world. When I got tapped for a mission in the vast Gila National Forest in New Mexico, I figured it was some kind of hazing ritual, missing campers, maybe a suspected cartel drop site, nothing that exciting. Boy, was I wrong. The first few days were uneventful, standard grid searches, questioning folks at the ranger station, the usual small-town mix of helpful and tight-lit. The sense of unease started the day I stumbled upon a campsite. Not the cozy family kind. This was a hunter's setup, old-school canvas tent, the fading scent of a campfire. The disturbing part was the lack of, well, a body. There were signs of a struggle, ripped fabric, dragged marks leading into the trees, blood spatters on the rocks. But no identifiable remains, nothing that pointed to an animal attack or a human assailant. Just an absence where a person used to be. My report got me assigned a partner, Burke, an ex-military type with the stereotypical square jaw and eyes that seemed to miss nothing. He didn't belittle my find, listened to my theory that whatever did this was strong enough to carry off a full-grown man. His only comment was a grim, Let's hope it's full and don't come looking for dessert. He taught me to track like my life depended on it, which out there, it just might. The trail was faint, and what we could decipher made no sense. The stride was long, but inconsistent, and the prince. There was a main pad clawed, but the edges were serrated in a way no bear or mountain lion should be. We followed those bizarre tracks for the better part of a day, the forest silent as a tomb around us. Late afternoon, we found what was left of the hunter, Hoisted nearly ten feet up a massive pine tree was his backpack, snagged on a splintered branch, and beneath it, fragments. Enough to confirm an ID, not much more. The coroner back in town muttered about extreme crushing force, as if the guy had been wrung out like a dish rag. He tried to pass it off as a freak accident, falling timber or something, but Burke and I exchanged a look. We'd seen the prince, the effortless strength needed for that kind of brutal hoisting. This wasn't a damn logging mishap. Something changed in the air then. Even Burke, with his stoic ex-soldier routine, couldn't mask the tension coiling in his shoulders. I was on edge too, that prickly feeling at the back of my neck a constant, buzzing annoyance. We weren't alone. I caught glimpses of movement in the dense undergrowth, not deer, too deliberate. Eyes gleaming back at us in the deepening twilight. We made camp early, in a narrow defensible ravine. One man on watch while the other tried to snatch a few hours of restless sleep. My turn ended just before dawn, the sky tinged with that eerie pre-sunrise gray. And that's when I saw it. Crouched on a rocky outcrop above our camp was the creature. It looked almost human at first, until you took in the proportions, the impossibly long limbs, the hunched posture that was all wrong. Its skin was bark brown and textured, rippling as it moved, blending seamlessly with its surroundings. And its head, there was something about the shape of the skull, the gaping void where a mouth should be, that triggered a primal revulsion deep in my gut. Just as I opened my mouth to shout a warning, it moved. 
not the blur of a predator attack, but an unsettling series of jerky, stop-motion twitches that brought it directly behind Burke in the blink of an eye. One clawed hand, its fingers were more like gnarled branches than digits, shot out and clamped over his mouth. The other closed around his head with a soft crunching sound that made my stomach lurch. I had my gun drawn, but my brain couldn't process the impossibility of what I was seeing. It squeezed, and Burke went limp like a puppet with its strings cut. The creature straightened, its twiggy arm rising in the dim light, holding Burke's shattered skull like a grotesque trophy. The shock broke then replaced by a searing bolt of terror. I fired blindly, the gunshots echoing deafeningly in the silent dawn. The creature dropped my partner's body and looked at me. In its eyes, bulbous and black, I didn't see bloodlust. There was something far more chilling, an appraising, insect-like curiosity. It didn't advance. It simply melted back into the trees— its form warping and dissolving into dappled shadows. I stumbled back to the campfire, fumbled for the radio, my voice a hoarse wreck as I frantically called for backup. What came was worse than disbelief. It was the tight-lipped debriefing, the subtle suggestions that fatigue and stress had gotten the better of me. The official report listed Burke as a missing person, another unsolved case in the Gila wilderness. His family got the standard condolence letter, another casualty of the unforgiving wilds. But I know what I saw. I know what's still out there. My name is Nathaniel Drake, and this happened to me on July 16, 2018. Sounds odd for a story like this to start so ordinary, doesn't it? I'm ex-army, transitioned to the CIA, and somehow landed on the Bureau's weirdest desk. The one where conspiracy theorists are occasionally right, and unexplained, is just code for. Not yet understood. My first proper assignment should have been simple. A series of disappearances in and around Sequoia National Park. Hikers, the odd park ranger, locals who knew those woods like the back of their hands gone without a trace. No bodies, no signs of struggle, nothing that fit the usual missing person patterns. My initial report basically stated, the trees might have eaten them, and I half expected to get laughed back to a cubicle. Instead, I got a plain ticket and an uneasy feeling that my superiors knew more than they were saying. Sequoia country is awe-inspiring. Giant trees, those redwoods that make you feel like an ant, sunlight filtering through ancient branches, picture postcard stuff. But there's also a sense of unease there, a stillness that prickles at the back of your neck. Locals I spoke with told whispered stories about things seen deep in the forests, Shadows that moved wrong, the feeling of being watched while utterly alone. I dismissed it then, chalked it up to small-town superstition mixed with a dash of very real fear after losing folks to whatever was out there. I spent weeks chasing my tail. Camera traps revealed nothing but skittish deer. Motion sensors, the highly sensitive kind, picked up odd bursts of movement, too big to be an animal but erratically spaced, not the pattern of anything hunting. Frustration ate at me, the feeling I was missing a piece of the puzzle gnawing at my gut. The break, when it came, was pure dumb luck. A kid camping with his family wandered off trail, claimed to have followed a shiny deer. The parents were frantic, the search parties grim, expecting the worst. We found the kid two days later huddled beneath a moss-covered boulder, scared half out of his mind but otherwise unharmed. His description of the creature he'd seen was fantastical. It didn't match any animal, not even remotely. Most dismissed it as the ramblings of a terrified child, 
But a veteran ranger named Kendrick pulled me aside, his weathered face tight. It lined up eerily close with old native legends he'd been told growing up on the nearby reservation. He described a creature of shifting form, mimicking its surroundings to move unseen. Its eyes glowed amber, he told me, and its touch burned like dry ice. The legends called it the Hide Behind, a trickster spirit, not malevolent, exactly, but dangerously indifferent to a creature as fragile as a human. Armed with a kernel of impossible truth, the investigation shifted. If this thing was a master of camouflage, we needed new ways of seeing. I sweet-talked the higher-ups into borrowing some experimental gear thermal imaging modified to pick up subtle shifts against the background, the kind of tech that was half a step from science fiction. The first field trial almost made me a laughingstock. We spent nights traipsing through the woods, chasing thermal anomalies that turned out to be squirrels a surprisingly warm rock, and my own overactive imagination. Then, on the fifth night, we got a hit that set my teeth on edge. A figure materialized on the thermal screen, humanoid, but its surface rippled strangely, patches of it blending seamlessly with the tree bark and mossy rocks. It turned its head towards the camera, and two pinpricks of amber light flared in the darkness. I swore aloud, heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. We got it. Kendrick breathed, rifle steadied. The orders were observation and containment. Engagement only as a last resort, especially considering the vanished folks seemed unharmed, at least so far. We tracked it, the creature moving with a terrifying, unhurried grace. It led us deeper into the forest toward an area locals called the Grizzly Maze a tangle of fallen giants and dense undergrowth. It was just past dusk when we lost sight of it. The thermal signature simply blinked out. One moment it was there, the next the screen showed nothing but ancient trees and cool, damp earth. Kendrick and I exchanged a tense look. We were out of our depth, playing a game we barely understood— and the prize felt very much like our own hides. Then, the forest exploded with sound. A shriek that was part bird, part something I couldn't name tore through the air. Kendrick lurched forward, eyes wide. Tommy! He shouted a name I didn't catch, and then he was crashing through the underbrush, rifle held high. I hesitated for a fatal second, then sprinted after him. We burst into a clearing moments later. The scene was out of a nightmare. A family of hikers, maybe five of them, were backed against a massive fallen sequoia, batting at the air with futile gestures of terror. Surrounding them were creatures. Three of them, to be exact, mirroring the rippling thermal signature we'd tracked earlier, their twiggy limbs impossibly long, reaching... Their forms kept shifting in a sickening display of mimicry. Patches of bark, clumps of moss, even the dap of light filtering through the canopy seemed to swirl and cling to them. But I could see their true shapes beneath the camouflage, tall and skeletally thin, with oversized hands tipped with claws that scraped against wood in agitation. The hikers were screaming, one woman already on the ground— her leg a mess of crimson against the fallen leaves. My training kicked in on autopilot. I raised my rifle, firing off a warning shot that echoed deafeningly in the sudden hush. The creatures froze, their amber eyes flaring bright. I shouted something about standing down, but the words felt pathetically inadequate. I wasn't sure if these things even understood language as we know it. Kendrick charged into the clearing, eyes blazing with a fury that eclipsed even my own fear. He aimed his rifle not at the creatures, but at a point just above them, and fired. A shower of severed branches and leaves rained down, momentarily disrupting their camouflage. One lashed out in his direction, 
but he was already moving, herding the terrified hikers away, deeper into the trees. I was left alone in the clearing. Three impossible predators focused on me. There was a moment, stretched unbearably thin, where we simply assessed each other. I could feel their gaze on me, not malevolent, exactly, but filled with a chilling, insect-like curiosity. And beneath that, a flicker of hunger. Maybe it was the scent of fear, or the way I stood apart from the rest of the herd. Either way, their attention settled on me like a physical weight. One of the creatures lunged. Not in a straightforward rush, but in a disjointed, flickering series of movements that made it nearly impossible to track. I fired, more on instinct than aim, and heard a startled chirp as one of its twiggy arms snapped. It stumbled to the side, rippling and reforming into a distorted imitation of an exposed tree root. The other two flanked me, their movements eerily coordinated. I was trapped. It wasn't the certainty of death that filled me, but a chilling sense of insignificance. To these creatures, I was simply prey, no smarter or more complex than a rabbit caught in the open. Just when I thought they'd strike, a new sound tore through the air, a deep guttural roar that shook the very ground beneath my feet. The creatures froze, and from the tree line, something massive emerged. I'm not talking black bear or grizzly. This thing was enormous, a good nine feet at the shoulder, with gleaming bone-white fur and eyes that burned red in the fading light. It moved with the terrifying fluidity of a predator, its toothy maw pulled back in a snarl that exposed impossibly long canines. The creatures, the hide-behinds, shrank back, their rippling forms revealing patches of fearful black beneath the camouflage. This behemoth, whatever it was, was something they instinctively feared. The beast, I still can't classify it, not definitively, lunged. The fight was a blur of snapping teeth and flashing claws, a brutal ballet of primeval fury. A hide behind shrieked, a sound like fingernails on glass, and then it was gone, vanished back into mimicry. Its companions followed, blending into the forest and leaving the clearing eerily silent. The massive beast paused, its bloody muzzle gleaming as it turned those burning red eyes on me. A low growl rumbled deep in its chest, but it didn't advance. Then, just as abruptly as it arrived, it whirled and vanished back into the undergrowth. The silence that settled was broken by choked sobs. It took me a moment to realize they were my own. The aftermath was a mess of bureaucracy and half-truths. The injured woman survived, her story dismissed as a bare attack. The rest of the hikers, profoundly traumatized, were debriefed and all traces of their accounts buried in classified files. Kendrick refused to speak about what he'd seen. The kid who'd wandered off only remembered following a shiny deer, nothing else. My sighting of the bone-white behemoth was the closest thing to an official acknowledgement of the impossible. They started calling it the Guardian whispering about evolutionary offshoots and prehistoric throwbacks. I don't buy it. There was something eerily intelligent in those red eyes, something that watched us back with cold assessment. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't an animal. It was another player in a game I still don't comprehend. After Sequoia, I could have walked away, could have requested a transfer back to a sane world of human threats and counterespionage. But I'm still with the Unexplained Phenomena Task Force, or whatever they're calling it this week. It's partly morbid fascination, and partly the unshakable belief that if those things, the hide-behinds, the guardian, whatever else lurks in the shadows, are out there, someone needs to track them. Someone needs to be waiting in the dark hoping like hell backup arrives before we're swallowed whole. The Sequoia case is marked, partially resolved, and life goes on. 
hikers planned trips on sunny afternoons, unaware of the shadows that watched them back. Locals still whispered the old legends around campfires, their voices a mix of fear and an odd, ingrained all. Maybe they understand something the task force and the suits back in D.C. don't. Maybe out there, in the wild places where the trees grow tall and the sunlight barely reaches the ground, it's wiser to accept that humans aren't always at the top of the food chain. Sometimes, we're just part of this strange and terrifying ecosystem. My name is Ezra Vance, and this happened to me on October 12, 2019. Sounds like the start of a bad horror flick, right? Fresh-faced government agent out of his depth stumbles upon something the locals have whispered about for generations. Well, sometimes the clichés exist for a reason. See, I wasn't your average Sudanti CIA analyst. I grew up in those woods. Not the cutesy National Park kind, but the tangle of Appalachia where cell reception dies and old-timers still leave out salt for the things they refuse to name. Made me an odd fit for the Bureau, but when your cover story is local eccentric with an interest in unexplained phenomena, it helps to actually be a local eccentric. My assignment was simple enough investigate a rash of disappearances in and around West Virginia's Monongahela National Forest. Nothing new, mind you, those woods have been swallowing folks for centuries. But there was a spike in cases, a pattern the higher-ups found, interesting. My job was to determine if it was a threat worth their attention. Spoiler alert, turns out it was. I started with the usual. Missing person reports, last known sightings, the standard investigative grind. Most leads petered out quickly, the kind of sad and mundane vanishings that happen in the wilderness. Then there was the Lewis case. Lewis, a seasoned hunter, vanished without a trace from a campsite littered with blood and scraps of fabric snagged high on the trees, as if something had ripped him apart well above ground level. That got my attention. With local law enforcement less than enthused about my fed nosing around routine, I went solo. Spent weeks in that forest, setting up motion-censored cameras, interviewing tight-lipped locals who eyed me with a mix of suspicion and pity. If the stories were true, I wasn't just hunting a predator, I was hunting a legend, the skin-taker, some monstrous creature born out of campfire tales and backwoods paranoia. Days turned into nights, and I found precisely nothing. No strange tracks, no unexplained camera triggers, just the gnawing feeling I was missing a piece of the puzzle. Then, on the edge of giving up, I made a rookie mistake. I got sloppy. Left my send-on gear, lingered too long in one spot. It saw me before I ever saw it. First, there was the sound. A rustling of leaves that shouldn't have been there, too quick and sharp for the wind. Then a whisper of movement in my peripheral vision, a flicker of something wrong. When I turned, it was hunched beneath a tangle of rhododendron branches, watching me. Its size was deceptive at first. Low to the ground, its silhouette was almost canine. Then it stood, unfolding itself to an impossible height. Tree trunk limbs, fingers like gnarled roots, and a head, no words can do its head justice. Like a shattered, hollowed out deer skull stretched over a vaguely human shape, filled with a writhing darkness. It let out a hissing sigh that raised the hair on my neck, a sound that didn't belong in the natural world. I fumbled for my rifle, terror battling with ingrained training. Yet, the creature didn't charge. It tilted its ghastly head, those empty eye sockets seeming to bore into me. The wrongness of it, the sheer violation of everything I knew about biology, 
sent a wave of dizzying nausea through me. Then came the second sound. It tore my gaze upward to the canopy above. There, perched like monstrous crows, were two more of its kind. Their ragged forms were barely visible against the twilight, but I could hear their rasping breaths, smell the fetid stench of rotting leaves and wet earth that clung to them. That's when I broke. I don't mean I cried or fell to my knees, though God knows I wanted to. I mean something inside me snapped, replaced by the cold clarity of pure survival instinct. I turned and ran, not in any planned direction, just blind desperate flight. Branches whipped my face and tore at my clothes. I could hear them behind me, not the galumphing lope of a pursuing animal, but the quick, erratic scrabbling of too many legs. Once, I tripped and fell, and for a heart-stopping second I swore I felt a twig-like hand brush against my boot before I scrambled upright again. I don't know how long I ran. Eventually, I stumbled out onto a logging road, collapsing in a gasping heap. The creatures weren't there. Whether they lost interest or something else held them back, I'll never know. I made it back to civilization, filed a report so outlandish I'm surprised it didn't get me committed. The Lewis case is still open, my encounter dismissed as trauma-induced hallucination. Officially, the skin takers don't exist. Unofficially? Well, there's a reason those agency desks look so appealing after that. But sometimes, at night, I still hear the rustle of leaves in the still city air, and I remember those empty eyes watching me from the darkness. My name is Thomas Redfern, and this happened to me on February 1st, 2023. I'd like to tell you the story, but I want to warn you, it's gruesome. It's about something that shouldn't be real, something that still haunts me at night. I worked for the CIA, still do, in fact. I was part of a division you've never heard of. We handled anomalies in the field things that defied explanation. The first twenty years of my career were, let's say, mundane. Standard espionage stuff. But then the call came, and my life changed forever. We were deployed to the Ozark Mountains in Missouri. Locals reported missing persons over the year. But not just that, there were also strange sightings. Descriptions of creatures that didn't add up. We were tasked with finding the answer, if there was one. My team consisted of myself, Dr. Amelia Carter, a biologist with a specialty in taxonomy, and two other field agents, Jackson and Davis. We were all experienced, veterans in our line of work. Still, I felt uneasy. My gut told me that this was more than just a missing persons case. We set up base camp in a remote part of the forest, a good five-mile hike from the last reported disappearance. Our equipment was state-of-the-art, infrared, motion detectors, trail cams, the whole shebang. We settled into the routine, set up perimeters, calibrate cameras, monitor radio frequencies. It was tedious but necessary. We joked about Bigfoot and alien abductions, mostly to break the tension, but there was a nagging worry at the back of my mind. The first two weeks were a bust. Nothing on the sensors, no movement, not even the usual forest critters. Amelia started to question the assignment. Jackson, always the optimist, kept saying, Just wait until they find out who we are. Then, on the fifteenth day, everything changed. Amelia picked up something on the thermal cameras. It was big, moving fast through the trees, leaving an erratic thermal signature. Whatever it was, it was heading straight for base camp. Redfern, get a visual. Amelia's voice crackled over the radio. 
I grabbed night vision goggles and my rifle and headed into the undergrowth. There was rustling in the bushes, the snapping of branches. The forest was eerily quiet. My breath came in short bursts, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I knew I wasn't alone. I saw it, a hunched figure, at least eight feet tall, moving unnaturally fast. It had elongated limbs, skeletal almost, and its skin I couldn't describe the skin. It was shifting, changing texture like it was made of shifting shadows. The head was, I still can't put it into words. Elongated, with too many teeth and eyes that burned like embers in the darkness. It turned toward me. For a brief, terrifying moment, those fiery eyes stared directly into mine. My body froze, refusing to act. I knew this thing wasn't human, or an animal. It was something else entirely. Something from a nightmare. Then it bolted. It disappeared into the thick brush, moving with a blinding speed that seemed to defy physics. I stood there, shaking. I wasn't sure if I was more terrified by the sighting or by the fact that I had frozen like a frightened prey animal. I stumbled back to camp. My voice cracked as I relayed what I saw to Amelia. Her face was pale, any skepticism gone. Jackson and Davis looked at me with wide eyes, a mix of fear and awe written on their faces. What the hell are we dealing with? Davis breathed. I don't know, I admitted. But it knows we're here. The next few days were a blur of terror. The creature stalked us. We picked it up on the cameras and heard it rustling around the camp at night. It left gifts. I woke up one morning and found the mangled corpse of a deer just outside my tent. On another morning, a human arm, severed clean at the shoulder, was left hanging from a branch. The message was clear, you're next. We decided we had to run. We tried to make it back to the extraction point and radio for backup. Maybe if we had greater numbers, but in my heart I knew there was no force we could muster that would defeat the thing in the woods. The escape plan turned into a desperate scramble through the dense forest. It seemed the creature knew every twist and turn of those woods. It toyed with us, guiding us deeper into the heart of its territory. It wasn't just about the hunt anymore. This was something twisted, a sadistic game. We moved as a tight group, Amelia and I taking the lead. Jackson and Davis covered the rear. We couldn't risk splitting up, not with the creature on our heels. It's like it's hurting us. Amelia panted as she pushed through a tangle of undergrowth. I didn't like the sound of that. We were becoming its cattle, ready for slaughter. Fear and exhaustion gnawed at my resolve. Every rustle of leaves made me jump. But there was no time to falter. We just had to keep moving toward the distant highway, our only hope of escape. The sun dipped below the tree line, plunging the forest into shadows. We were running on fumes and adrenaline. That's when we fell for the trap. The creature had led us right into a clearing. Dead trees littered the space, creating a gnarled, skeletal playground. And there, in the failing light, we saw its true form, or at least the form it had chosen. It was massive now. Its limbs stretched even longer, ending in sharp claws. The head was a monstrous caricature, teeth dripping with saliva, eyes burning with malicious intent. It had evolved, adapting to its role as the forest's apex predator. Jackson went down first. He swore, turned, and fired a desperate shot. The bullet vanished into the creature's shifting flesh. It lunged at him a flurry of claws. I didn't want to watch, but I couldn't turn away. Jackson screamed, a scream that cut through the forest, then ended abruptly. Davis and Amelia charged, 
their rifles screaming in defiance. The creature was an unstoppable force. Davis stumbled, his leg caught in the twisted roots of a dead tree. The creature was on him in an instant, its teeth ripping through his throat in a horrifying splatter of red. I ran. That primal, base instinct to survive consumed me. But Amelia wouldn't let me go. She grabbed my arm, shouting over the deafening roar of the gunshots. Redfern, we fight together! We did. We turned and fired, emptying our magazines. The bullets seemed to slow the creature, but not stop it. Each hit was followed by a grotesque shifting of its form, its flesh seeming to melt and reform around the wound. It's adapting! Amelia yelled, her eyes wide with horror. And that's when I saw it, an opening, a desperate gamble. Amelia, follow me! I shouted. I grabbed her hand and sprinted toward the edge of the clearing. There was a cliff, a sheer drop of at least a hundred feet. Amelia's eyes met mine, realization and utter fear. I nodded, and then we were running toward the edge, the monstrous roar of the creature echoing behind us. The wind rushed in my ears as we launched ourselves into the darkness. I don't remember the fall. I must have blacked out. I woke up hours later, in a hospital bed. My body felt like it had been hit by a truck. A nurse told me I'd miraculously survived, found at the base of the cliff. Amelia, too, had clung to life. But Jackson and Davis weren't so lucky. Our story was dismissed. Bear attack, the official report said. We were debriefed warned never to speak of what we saw. The CIA doesn't like loose ends, especially ones that defy explanation. They silenced us, buried the truth. And the creature? It's still out there. Years passed. I left the CIA, moved to a remote cabin, tried to drink away the nightmares. Amelia retreated into her lab, desperately trying to find some trace of that creature a way to prove it exists. But the world moved on, forgetting the missing persons and the deaths in the Ozark Mountains. They called it a tragedy, an unfortunate accident. But I know what it was, a massacre. We were sacrificed, just more bodies added to the pile of that, things victims. Sometimes I hear its call in the wind, that grotesque howl echoing through the trees and I know it won't forget. It will hunt us down, even after all this time. We might have escaped the forest, but we will never escape the predator. My name is Marcus Webb, and this happened to me back in 1998. I was a fresh-faced agent in the CIA's paranormal division. Yeah, you read that right. The stuff you see in bad movies? We dealt with the real thing. Monsters, anomalies, things that shouldn't exist yet somehow did. Back then, I was cocky, thought I knew everything, until the Arizona incident changed my life forever. It all started with a series of bizarre disappearances. Hikers, campers vanishing in the Superstition Mountains, a rugged desert wilderness east of Phoenix. Locals whispered about old Apache curses, vengeful spirits, but none of that added up. The disappearances were too clean. No bodies, no traces, nothing. They sent me in, along with another agent, Rosalind Cooper, an ex-army ranger with nerves of steel. We set up camp near the base of the mountains, standard surveillance gear, the works. Figure we'd spend a few weeks scoping out the area, maybe catch something on camera. For a while, it was mind-numbingly boring. Hot days, freezing nights, and a hell of a lot of sand in places I didn't want sand. Rosalind kept the morale up, cracking jokes and telling war stories. 
One night we were sitting around the campfire, eating freeze-dried beef stew. Suddenly, Rosalind went silent, her eyes locked on something in the darkness beyond the firelight. What is it? I asked, my hand instinctively going from my glock. I thought I heard something. She trailed off, then shrugged, adding, Probably just some desert critter. I nodded but couldn't shake the feeling we were being watched. That night, either of us slept well. At dawn, we packed up, heading deeper into the mountains. The terrain got rougher, jagged rocks and steep gullies. The higher we climbed, the less it felt like Arizona and more like another planet. Mid-afternoon, we came across a ledge, overlooking a small canyon. That's where we found it, the first sign of the disappearances. A backpack, ripped open, contents scattered. Then, further down the ledge, what looked like dragged marks in the sand, like something heavy had been pulled into the canyon. Someone, or something, was here recently, Rosalind said, her voice grim. I swallowed, suddenly aware of how exposed we were. We drew our weapons and proceeded cautiously down into the canyon. When we reached the drag marks, they stopped abruptly. It was like whatever had been there just vanished into thin air. Suddenly, Rosalind shrieked and pointed. In the wall of the canyon, we saw a crack, a crevice just wide enough for a person to squeeze through. It hadn't been there when we passed this spot earlier. What the hell is going on? I muttered, more to myself than Rosalind. A noise echoed from within the crack, a low, guttural growl that sent shivers down my spine. We exchanged a glance, steeled ourselves, and stepped into the darkness. The passageway was surprisingly smooth, like someone had carved it into the rock, but not with human tools. It had an organic quality almost like being inside the belly of a beast. Rosalind flicked on her tactical flashlight, the beam swallowed by the inky blackness ahead. Every few feet, we found another sign of struggle, a boot heel, a scrap of a torn shirt. Each artifact made us more apprehensive. We moved in a defensive crouch, guns pointed, adrenaline pounding in our ears. Then we saw it, or rather, we saw the eyes. Two pinpricks of malevolent green light glowed in the darkness ahead. Then, the creature stepped into view, and my world shifted. It was tall, at least twelve feet, hunched over on four spindly legs. The skin. I don't know how to describe it. It was translucent, constantly shifting color and texture, sometimes mirroring the surrounding rock then shimmering with an oily, iridescent sheen. The head, that's where the nightmares come from. It was elongated, with a fang maw that opened vertically, and rows of glistening, multifaceted eyes like a monstrous insect. It hissed, bearing serrated teeth and a grotesque caricature of a smile. For a moment, time seemed to freeze. Rosalind and I stared at the abomination— and it stared back. I'd been trained for a thousand scenarios, but nothing prepared me for this. Then, the creature lunged. Rosalind's instincts kicked in before mine even registered the movement. She fired, the gunshot booming in the confined space. I followed suit, emptying my magazine as the creature blurred towards us. The bullets didn't seem to do much, they ripped through its shifting flesh, causing it to flicker and distort, but those wounds closed almost as quickly as they appeared. The creature slammed into Rosalind, knocking her against the wall. Her weapon flew from her grip, clattering on the stones. I charged, trying to distract it. The thing swiped at me, a clawed hand passing through my shoulder like it was smoke. I cried out more in shock than pain. A flicker of the creature's flesh revealed my reflection, and for a sickening second, I saw my own body rippling as if submerged in water. 
desperation fueling me, I grabbed the creature's arm, sinking my fingers into the malleable flesh. It squealed, an inhuman, bone-chilling sound, and jerked back, ripping away from my grip. I stumbled, then grabbed Rosalind, pulling her back the way we'd come. The creature didn't immediately follow, but I knew it wouldn't be far behind. We sprinted through the twisting tunnel, our flashlights cutting swaths of light through the darkness. The air crackled with an unsettling energy. Each ragged breath filled my lungs with the smell of damp stone and something foul like rotten meat. Behind us, the creature's guttural growls reverberated, getting closer with each second. Rosalind reached into her pack, fingers scrabbling frantically. My heart hammered against my ribs as I realized what she was looking for. Grenade! She shouted, pulling the pin. I grabbed it from her and hurled it back toward the pursuing creature just as we stumbled out of the crevice. We ducked for cover as the detonation echoed through the canyon, momentarily illuminating the rock walls with a blinding flash. I waited, breathless, for the dust to settle. When I dared look back, the crevice in the canyon wall was gone, sealed as if it had never existed. But the creature, was it gone too? We waited for what felt like an eternity. No sign of it. We crept back towards the sealed opening, the stench of sulfur and something acrid filling the air. I had no illusions. It was out there, biding its time, or maybe it was wounded, retreating deeper into its subterranean lair. Back to base camp, now! Rosalind's voice was ragged with exhaustion and a barely contained fear. We stumbled back the way we came, the desert landscape now an alien and hostile world. We made it back, reporting the situation. The response was swift and clinical. A team in hazmat suits descended into the canyon, scouring the area. Nothing. No creature, no tunnel entrance. No sign that anything out of the ordinary had ever occurred. Official report? Unexplained rock slide must have dislodged the bodies. Rosalind and I were reassigned, given amnestics to erase the incident from our memories. They even tried replacing our scarred flesh with skin grafts to remove any physical residue of our encounter. But some scars don't fade. I left the CIA moved to Alaska, as remote as I could get. Thought the isolation might help me forget. It didn't. Neither did the booze. Rosalind tracked me down a few years later. She wasn't doing great either. Haunted eyes, a nervous tick in her jaw. It knows we escaped, she'd said, a bleak certainty in her voice. It will find us. She was right. Sometimes, late at night, I feel the shifting in the air, like the membrane separating reality from whatever nightmare dimension that creature came from is getting thinner. I see movement out of the corner of my eye, the oily glisten of its skin. I hear the hiss of its voice, promising a return engagement. The doctors call it PTSD. Shell shock. They prescribe meds that make my dreams even worse. They offer therapy, support groups with other ex-agents who've seen things they shouldn't have. But none of it helps. They can't understand what lurks out there, waiting for me in the shadows. The Superstition Mountains? They carry a fitting name, after all. Superstition, or some primal knowledge from long before the Apache, an ancestral memory of the monsters that hunt in the dark? I don't know how this ends. The creature might be satisfied with slowly driving me mad, tormenting me for the remainder of my life. Or maybe, one night, that membrane will tear, and it will step through. Either way, the story isn't over. Not by a long shot. My name is Kieran Davis, 
and this happened to me back in 2009. I was an analyst for the CIA, not a field agent, but sometimes those distinctions blur, especially when you work for the cryptozoology division, or whatever the heck it was really called. We handled the weird stuff, unexplained sightings, folklore with a potential real-world basis, anomalies that defied categorization. I got called into the Nevada case because I had a background in anthropology, a fascination for Native American cultures. Seemed like some hikers had vanished in the Ruby Mountains, a rugged range in the northeastern part of the state. Standard missing person stuff at first glance, but then came the odd details. Locals whispered about a cursed mountain, about how the land itself was hungry. Something about those whispers resonated with me, reminded me of stories I'd encountered during my research. My boss, Hendricks, sent me in along with two seasoned field agents, Blake, a grizzled ex-marine with a voice like sandpaper, and Carter, a tech specialist who saw everything through the lens of infrared cameras and sonic monitors. The locals clammed up when we arrived, but they couldn't hide the fear in their eyes. That fear became our own as we ventured into the mountains. The Ruby Mountains, there's a reason they're called that. The rock formations, especially at sunset, shimmer with a blood-red hue, almost like they're lit from within. We set up base camp in a high valley, a sweep of alpine meadows ringed by jagged peaks. That first night, under a sky ablaze with stars, it felt like we were the only living creatures for miles. A naive thought. The days turned into an unsettling routine. We found no trace of the missing hikers, no gear, no campsites, no sign they had ever been there at all. Carter's gadgets picked up nothing unusual. Frustration tinged the edges of our voices as we radioed into HQ each night. Even Blake, the stoic one, started to grumble under his breath. The fourth day is when everything changed. I was hiking alone along a ridgeline, examining some petroglyphs etched into a boulder. The air felt thick suddenly, the hairs on my neck prickling. I heard a low rumble, like some kind of immense machinery working deep beneath the earth. Then the ground in front of me gave way, and I was tumbling down into darkness. I landed hard, the breath knocked out of me. Pain seared through my ankle, and I knew it was broken. Then I saw where I was, a cavern, no, more like a vast subterranean tunnel, carved from the raw bedrock. The walls glowed faintly with a pulsating purple luminescence that I couldn't explain. And in the center of this cavernous space, it was there. The creature was monstrous. At least twenty feet tall, vaguely insectoid, with segmented limbs that ended in razor-sharp claws. Its body had a segmented quality, like an oversized beetle but armored with thick, chitinous plates. And the head... That's where sanity threatened to slip its leash. It had a gaping maw ringed with hooked mandibles, but the true horror was the eyes, compound eyes like a fly's, but each facet reflecting a fractured image of the cavern, or maybe of me. I don't know how long I stared at it, frozen in terror. Some primal part of my brain kicked in, scrambling for survival. With what strength I could muster, I fumbled for my pistol, the one concession Hendrix had allowed me to carry. The creature moved, not fast, but with a terrifying, fluid grace that made its bulk seem obscene. I fired, the shots booming through the cavern. They hit, tearing holes in the creature's carapace, but they seemed to do no real damage. It kept coming unfazed. My mind raced. This thing... It was responsible for the disappearances, I knew it. But how? Where did they go? Its segmented body pulsated, and then it struck like a viper, one clawed limb slashing across my chest. I felt ribs snap, 
tasted blood in my mouth. Blindly, I fired another shot, point blank. The creature recoiled, screeching, an unearthly sound that threatened to shatter my eardrums. And then it was gone, scuttling back into the darkness with that impossible, fluid speed. I don't know how long I lay there, bleeding and fading. Blake and Carter must have heard the gunshots, or maybe my absence triggered an alarm. They found me, dragged me back to base camp, patched me up as best they could. A chopper arrived the next morning, whisking me away from the blood-red mountains and the creature within. Hendricks was waiting when I came out of surgery. His face was grim. The official story, he told me, was an accidental fall, a cave-in. Nobody's going back there, Davis. You're on medical leave, indefinitely. Medical leave turned into a forced early retirement. They offered therapy, hush money, everything to make me forget. But how can you forget a nightmare made flesh? I moved, hid myself away in a small town in Vermont, thinking the distance might dull the memory. It didn't. My name is Declan Murphy, and this happened to me back in 1994. I worked for what the CIA officially called the Office of Environmental Research, which translated to go check out the weird stuff nobody else will touch. We dealt with the things they tried to bury, unexplained disappearances in national parks, UFO sightings, livestock mutilations with a surgical precision, the fringe cases that didn't fit the official narrative. In May of 94, we were sent to Maine, a rash of disappearances in Acadia National Park. The pattern was troubling, healthy, experienced hikers vanishing on established trails in broad daylight. No witnesses, no evidence, just gone. The locals whispered about old Wabanaki legends, the Pomola, a bird spirit of the mountains, hungry for human prey. My partner, Evelyn Harris, scoffed at the folklore. She was ex army nerves of steel and a skeptical streak a mile wide. I figured she was the perfect counterbalance to my tendency to see shadows lurking in every corner. We set up a command post near Bar Harbor, the picturesque tourist town on the edge of the park. Interviews with the victims' families turned up nothing useful, mostly tears and pleas to find their loved ones. After a week, we were no closer to answers and the pressure from HQ was mounting. Evelyn suggested we do a hike, retrace the steps of the victims. I hesitated. Wasn't that just tempting fate? But I saw the logic in her approach. We chose the Beach Mountain Trail, site of two of the disappearances, a moderate five-mile loop popular with day hikers. The trail wound through dense evergreen forests, carpeted with damp pine needles, the scent of balsam in the air. Sunlight dappled the path. It was almost idyllic, until you remembered what this beautiful place hid. We hiked in silence for a while, scanning the woods, every rustle of leaves setting my teeth on edge. Evelyn broke the tension, saying, You believe in that bird spirit legend, Murphy? I shrugged. I keep an open mind. Plenty of cultures have tales of creatures that snatch people away. She snorted. Superstitious nonsense. There's a rational explanation for everything. I wished I shared her certainty. Somewhere deep down, a primal fear prickled at my senses, a growing sense we weren't alone. Around noon, we stopped for lunch at a rocky outcrop offering views of distant islands. I was munching on trail mix when it hit me. Absolute silence. No bird song, no insects, just an eerie quiet that settled over the forest like a smothering blanket. You notice that? I whispered to Evelyn. She frowned, looking into the trees. Something's off. 
she confirmed. I scanned the surrounding forest, heart pounding. Then I saw it, a flicker of movement high in the canopy. My breath hitched. Claws, enormous, hooked claws, gripping a thick branch. And above them, two eyes, burning like yellow embers in the dappled shade. Run! I shouted, lunging backwards. But Evelyn, ever the pragmatist, was reaching for her camera. Murphy, get a grip! This could be the break we need, proof, she argued. Before I could protest, the creature struck. It dropped from the trees with uncanny speed, a hulking, feathered shape at least ten feet tall. Its beak was razor sharp, its wings powerful enough to stir up a whirlwind of leaves and dust. Evelyn screamed as one massive claw snagged her backpack, yanking her off her feet and into the air. I ran, blindly, instinct taking over. Behind me, Evelyn's screams turned into a choked gurgle, then were abruptly cut off. The creature soared upwards, vanishing into the green canopy with its prey. I stumbled, fell to my knees, gasping for breath. Evelyn, gone. Just like the others. HQ sealed off the park. The official story was a freak storm. Evelyn killed in the line of duty. They knew I was lying, the suspicion in their eyes as heavy as guilt. I requested a discharge a month later. Couldn't stomach working for people who'd deny the truth, no matter its cost. I moved to New Mexico, land of desert and open skies, thinking I could escape the shadows of those woods. Big mistake. Turns out some nightmares follow you. Even out here, when the wind whistles through the canyons, I hear the rustle of its wings. I see its eyes, glowing in the darkness. And I know it's only a matter of time until it finds me. My name is Rowan Cooper, and this happened to me back in 2012. I was relatively green back then, a fresh-faced analyst at the CIA's Remote Sensing Division. We weren't the action heroes in black suits. We dealt with satellite intercepts, signals intelligence, the nerdy side of espionage. But sometimes the most terrifying things aren't found on the battlefield but on a computer screen. My downfall? Curiosity. The same trait that landed me in this job in the first place. See, we had access to classified satellite feeds most people don't even know exist. One slow night, I stumbled across something odd, images taken over Glacier National Park in Montana. Nothing strange about that, except for the timestamp, midnight dead of winter, during a blizzard. The image itself was mostly static, snow whipping across the grainy picture, obscuring everything. But in one frame, a flicker of movement in the distance caught my eye. I zoomed in, enhanced the image, and that's when I saw it. A massive silhouette, lumbering upright through the storm. At first, I thought it was a bear, maybe a grizzly out of hibernation. But the shape was wrong, the proportions too elongated. And then I saw the eyes, two crimson pinpricks of light, flaring in the darkness. The rational part of my brain kicked in. Bad image, optical illusion, overactive imagination fueled by too much coffee. I tried to dismiss it, focus on my paperwork. But I couldn't shake the feeling I'd glimpsed something, impossible. Over the next few days, I became obsessed. I started monitoring the satellite feeds myself, staying late, searching for any sign of the creature. My colleagues noticed my obsession, my haggard look, chalking it up to stress, burnout. Maybe they were right. Or maybe they saw what I was seeing and decided it was best left as a mystery. A week later, it happened again. Same spot, same timestamp. This time... The image was clearer. 
The creature, I couldn't think of it as anything else, was at least fifteen feet tall, with emaciated limbs like dead tree branches, ending in claws that could disembowel a man in one swipe. Its skin had a rough, pitted texture like ancient tree bark. Its face was the stuff of nightmares, long, emaciated, with a mouth full of jagged teeth. This time, there was something else in the image. A hiker, caught unaware in the blizzard, stumbled into the creature's path. The thing moved with deceptive speed, snatching the man up in one clawed hand. The last thing I saw was the hiker's scream, cut off abruptly as he disappeared into the creature's gaping maw. I sat frozen in front of the screen, heart pounding. It was proof solid evidence of something monstrous, unnatural, existing in one of America's most beloved natural parks. I should have alerted my superiors, demanded an investigation. Instead, I did the stupidest thing imaginable. I decided to go there myself. I told HQ I needed some RNR, filed a request for personal leave, and drove all the way to Montana. Madness? probably. But I was gripped by a morbid fascination, a need to prove to myself I wasn't delusional. I arrived at Glacier National Park in mid-February, the dead of winter. I rented a cabin outside of West Glacier, near the park's entrance. The next day, I ventured into the park. There was a primal fear lurking in the back of my mind, but I fought it down. I followed one of the smaller trails, figuring there was less chance of encountering another hiker that way. The air was frigid, the snow crunching beneath my boots. As daylight started to fade, I came to a clearing, ringed by ancient pines. That's where I saw them, footprints. Enormous, three-toed prints, pressed deep into the snow. My blood ran cold. I hadn't imagined it. The creature was real. Panic set in. I started to scramble back towards the trailhead, but I was too late. A guttural growl, low and rumbling, echoed from the trees. I turned, and there it was, stepping out from the shadows. Its eyes burned with predatory intelligence. I fumbled for the pistol I'd brought, more out of desperation than any real belief it would matter. The creature lunged. The pistol roared in my hand, the sound deafening in the snowy silence. I fired blindly, emptying the magazine in the creature's general direction. Bullets ripped into the rough bark-like skin, tearing chunks free, but causing no real damage. That's when I knew I was outmatched, facing something that was the stuff of nightmares, not nature. I turned and ran stumbling through the knee-deep snow. Behind me, the creature roared, an ear-splitting, rage-fueled sound that sent shivers down my spine. The trees blurred as I pushed myself to the limit. My lungs burned, my legs screamed, but the knowledge that I was hunted fueled my frantic flight. Ahead I saw the trailhead, my salvation. Just a few more yards. Then my boot caught on something, and I went sprawling. Pain shot through my ankle as I hit the icy ground. I tried to scramble back up, but it was too late. The creature stalked toward me, its clawed hand extended. I closed my eyes, bracing for the end. A moment of silence, and then a gunshot. Not mine. The report had a sharper crack, different caliber. Then a second shot, followed by a third. I flinched, expecting the killing blow, but it never came. Hesitantly, I opened my eyes. The creature was howling in fury, thrashing around, swatting at something in the trees. And then I saw her, a woman in woodland camo gear, wielding a hunting rifle. She barked another shot, sending the creature reeling back into the shadows. Get up! she shouted. Move! I didn't need to be told twice. I limped over to her, 
my breath coming in ragged gasps. The creature circled us warily, its eyes narrowing. Who are you? I choked out, my mind struggling to catch up. Name's Sarah, she replied curtly. Park Ranger. She gestured at the creature with her rifle. Seen that thing, or others like it, around here lately. Thought I was going crazy. You're not, I said, my voice shaking. I saw it, too, on satellite imagery. I told her everything, my words spilling out in a frenzied rush. The classified feeds, the images, my insane trip into the park. When I was done, Sarah surveyed me with a thoughtful expression. Guess you folks in Washington finally saw what we've been dealing with out here. She mused. She fired another shot at the creature now lurking at the edge of the clearing. It snarled but didn't retreat further. The standoff continued for what felt like an eternity, broken only by the echoing gunshots. Finally, as dust deepened and the creature seemed more agitated, Sarah made a decision. We get out of here, before it gets dark and brings its friends. Can you walk? I nodded, gritting my teeth against the throbbing in my ankle. We moved with painful slowness, back towards the trailhead, Sarah constantly scanning the tree line. The creature stalked us, staying within the shadows, a gruesome chaperone on our escape. We reached Sarah's truck just as full darkness settled. She bundled me in, started the engine, and gunned it down the snow-covered road, back towards civilization. The last thing I saw as we exited the park boundaries was a pair of malevolent red eyes glowing in the rearview mirror. In the aftermath, I was debriefed, threatened, and promptly relegated to a dusty desk job analyzing crop reports. My credibility evaporated, replaced by whispers of a mental breakdown. Sarah vanished. The disappearances in Glacier National Park continued, Blamed on animal attacks, rogue bears, the usual excuses for the unexplainable. Officially, the creature I saw doesn't exist. But sometimes, late at night, I feel a chill settle deep in my bones. And I know, out there in the vastness of the wilderness, it waits, biding its time. The boundary between our world and the realm of nightmares is thinner than we like to admit and I have the scars, both physical and mental, to prove it. I've never been back to Montana. I don't think I could face the mountains, the forests that now hold a nameless horror in my mind. But sometimes, in my dreams, I hear the echoing roar of the creature, and I see the flicker of those crimson eyes. And I remember that, for all our technology and hubris, some corners of this earth will always remain untamed, home to beings that defy our understanding and our attempts to control them. My name is Ethan Byrne, and this happened to me back in 2006. I'm a field agent with the CIA. Well, was. Let's just say things changed. My official title, if you bother to dig deep enough into the buried archives, is Crypto Threat Analyst. Unofficially, I deal with the things that get swept under the rug, the anomalies that don't play nice with the tidy worldview the agency wants to uphold. Monsters, basically. This particular assignment started with a cluster of missing person reports out of the Okefenokee Swamp, Georgia's largest national wildlife refuge, a vast labyrinth of murky waterways, moss-draped cypress, and primeval wilderness. The reports were odd. Victims vanished without a trace, no screams, no signs of struggle, just gone. Locals muttered about ancient legends, a creature out of their folk tales. The higher-ups scoffed, tasked me with debunking it, animal attacks, misidentified gators, 
the usual excuses for the unexplainable. I set up camp in a remote corner of the swamp, near the last known sighting. No fancy gear, just camouflage, a backpack with rations, and a high-powered rifle, more for reassurance than any real expectation I needed. I'm no stranger to the backcountry, have a healthy skepticism for swamp monster stories, but even I felt a prickle of unease as I ventured deeper into the watery morass. The first two days were a bust. The swamp has a strange beauty, oppressive, stifling, yet teeming with unseen life. But the creature, if it existed, remained elusive. Just as I started to doubt my own sanity, it happened. Late afternoon, the sun dipping below the thick canopy, and the air heavy with the buzzing of a million insects. I heard it. A low, guttural growl that seemed to come from the very depths of the swamp. Then a sound I'll never forget, thick branches cracking, something huge moving through the undergrowth parallel to my position. I froze, heart pounding, then slowly, cautiously, moved toward the source of the sound. Adrenaline fueled my steps. Stupid? Absolutely. But a morbid curiosity took hold. I had to see what lurked out there. The creature stepped into a clearing, and the breath caught in my throat. It was at least twelve feet tall, bipedal, with skin like mottled brown and green tree bark. The limbs were grotesquely elongated, ending in gnarled claws like scimitars. The head, that's what haunts me. It was long, tapered, with a lipless maw filled with jagged teeth. The eyes, flat and black, devoid of anything resembling human intelligence. Predator eyes. I should have run then, should have heeded every survival instinct screaming at me. Instead, paralyzed by shock, I just stood there, staring. The creature tilted its head, let out what might have been a hiss or a snarl. Then it moved, not with an animal rush, but with a terrifying, fluid speed utterly at odds with its ungainly form. I broke from my stupor, turned, and ran. The rifle was useless. I hadn't even had time to raise it. I heard the creature crashing through the swamp behind me, its guttural growls echoing in the humid air. Branches whipped at my face, roots snagged at my feet, but terror lent me wings. Up ahead, I saw a break in the foliage, the edge of a small lake. Salvation, I thought desperately. If I could just reach open water— I burst from the undergrowth, lungs burning, the monstrous pursuer close on my heels. And then the ground gave way under my feet. I tumbled forward, splashing into the murky water. Cold shock washed over me. Worse, panic threatened to drag me under. The lake bottom was soft, sucking at my boots. I fought to stay afloat, but my pack's weight threatened to turn me into an anchor. Then I saw it, an ancient cypress log, half-submerged near the bank. With a desperate lunge, I grabbed hold of its rough, wet surface. Behind me, the creature reached the water's edge. It hesitated, peering into the murk with what I could have sworn was a flicker of confusion in those inhuman eyes. Frantically, I hauled myself onto the log, kicking off my soaked boots and shedding the pack. The added height gave me a clear view. The creature was pacing the shoreline, clawed hands tearing at the vegetation in frustration. It knew I was out there, but it seemed afraid of the water. Slowly, so as not to provoke it, I inched further along the log, moving out deeper into the lake. The search party found me clinging to the log, shivering and babbling something about a monster. They pulled me from the lake, threw blankets around my shoulders, plied me with questions. And then came the looks. First confusion, then pity, and finally that condescending certainty reserved for those who've had their sanity shaken. I was shipped back to HQ, debriefed, 
subtly examined by psych evaluators, and promptly shoved into mandatory medical leave. Officially, it was exhaustion, stress-induced hallucinations. The unspoken message was clear. I had cracked under the pressure. The agency doesn't handle that kind of liability well. My career, once promising, was over. They offered a severance package, a bland NDA, and a strong suggestion to put Georgia and the swamp thing far behind me. I should have listened, should have taken the easy out, vanished into comfortable obscurity like they wanted. Instead, I became obsessed. It started with research, every obscure bit of folklore about the Okafenoki, every historical report of unexplained phenomena in the region. Turns out, I wasn't the first to encounter something strange out there. There was a pattern, stretching back centuries, people disappearing, whispers about monsters lurking in the deepest parts of the swamp. Then the research became planning. I used most of my severance pay to buy gear. Not agency-issue gear, mind you, this was off the books. Heavy-duty camping equipment, motion sensors, night vision goggles, a custom hunting rifle, rounds that could punch through thick hide and bone. And I got back in shape, running, working out, turning myself back into a weapon. The nightmares helped keep me motivated. Those eyes burning in the darkness, the sound of it crashing through the trees. After a year, I was ready. I told myself it was about closure, about proving my sanity. Maybe some small part of me clung to that. But deep down, I knew it was about vengeance. That creature took something from me, my career, my sense of control. And I was going to take something from it. Back to the swamp I went. This time, I chose my ground carefully, a place locals called Gator Hook a narrow spit of land jutting into a particularly wild section of marshland. I set up a meticulous network of motion sensors, marked out firing positions. I became a ghost, blending into the dripping moss and tangled roots, waiting. The days stretched into a tense, humid blur. Insects feasted on me, rain soaked me to the bone, but I endured. Then, on the fifth night, it happened. A sensor tripped. My heart hammered against my ribs as I peered at the thermal readout on my goggles. A heat signature, large and vaguely humanoid, was moving through the dense undergrowth towards my position. It was smarter than I expected. It didn't come directly through the sensor grid. It circled, testing, sniffing the air like it sensed the trap. I held my breath, rifle pressed to my shoulder. Sweat mingled with the rain on my face. And then it stepped into view, a monstrous silhouette against the moonlit water. Just like before, the shock took hold. All the training, all the preparation— couldn't fully erase the sheer wrongness of the thing moving with an impossible, predatory grace. But this time, I didn't freeze. I fired. The crack of the rifle tore through the swamp stillness, a man-made thunderclap against the primeval silence. The creature roared, a primal cry of pain and rage. It thrashed in the undergrowth, then lurched towards me, moving faster than it had any right to. I fired again and again, staggering it with each hit. But it kept coming. I was switching out magazines when it barreled out of the trees, so close I could smell the rank, swampy stench of it. It swiped at me with a clawed hand, and I stumbled backwards, tripping over a root. The rifle flew from my grasp. I scrambled back eyes wide with terror, reaching for my sidearm. The creature stalked towards me, head cocked, a grotesque parody of curiosity. It was toying with me. I fumbled for the pistol, but my fingers, numb with cold and fear, wouldn't cooperate. It was almost on top of me when the gunshot echoed. Not mine, 
This one had a sharper report. The creature let out a startled snarl, then staggered. A dark stain spread across the rough bark-like skin of its chest. Another shot rang out, then another. The creature twisted, trying to pinpoint the source of the attack. More pain-filled roars reverberated as bullets tore into its flesh. Stumbling now, it thrashed blindly, then turned and crashed back into the darkness. Breathing heavily, I got to my feet. A figure materialized from the shadows, a woman, lean and weathered, dressed in camouflage, holding a high-powered hunting rifle. Her eyes, narrowed under a battered hat, met mine with a cold intensity that sent a chill down my spine. Who the hell are you? I rasped. Name's Cora, she replied voice flat. Reckon you and I need to talk. She led me to her camp, a hidden, spartan affair on a patch of high ground miles from where I'd set up my ambush. It turned out the swamp was her territory. Cora was a poacher, hunter, and self-appointed protector of this place. She saw the creature two years ago. Enough to make it a personal vendetta. Over the next days, she schooled me. Not just about the creature— its patterns probable lair, but about the swamp itself, about survival on its terms. Cora was a survivalist in the purest sense, utterly at home in this harsh domain, human, yet somehow as much a part of this ecosystem as any gator or water moccasin. She made me feel soft, an outsider, someone who thought he understood nature's brutality, but was utterly naive to its true depths. We hunted the creature together, a strange partnership born of shared obsession and desperation. And one night, under a sliver of moon, we finally cornered it. The ensuing firefight was chaotic, a symphony of echoing gunshots and monstrous roars in the heart of the swamp. The creature fought with terrifying ferocity, fueled by pain and a desperate instinct to survive. In the end, it came down to a single, desperate shot as it charged from the undergrowth, Cora's bullet piercing that elongated skull. The creature crashed to the ground at our feet, its thrashing growing weaker, finally ceasing. Silence descended, broken only by our ragged breathing. It was dead. And with its death came not relief, but a strange sense of hollowness. Maybe some part of me believed that slaying the monster would slay my demons. It hadn't. Cora walked over to the creature's body, prodding it with the barrel of her rifle. Should burn it, she grunted. Make sure it don't come back. But I stopped her. I needed proof, something to take back to the world that had dismissed me as crazy. A photo, a bone fragment, anything. Cora just shook her head, a flicker of something like pity in those hard eyes. We left the creature where it lay, the swamp reclaiming it quickly. In the following months, no reports of strange disappearances made the news. Cora returned to her solitary existence, and I, well, I couldn't go back to my old life, not after what I'd seen. My name is Joe Carter, and this happened to me in 1994. I work as an agent for the CIA, in a special division that I can't tell you much about. Our business takes us to remote, and sometimes dangerous places. You could say I've been around the block once or twice. I've dealt with men who make your average gangster look like a boy scout but nothing in my training or experience prepared me for Wyoming's Wind River Reservation. They sent me there after a ranger went missing under odd circumstances. Not the first time something like this had happened, but this one had the higher-ups rattled. Word was it wasn't an animal attack. No, they thought it was something different. I rolled in with my partner, Laura. We were there to keep things discreet, not draw attention. 
The reservation isn't exactly welcoming to outsiders, especially those smelling of the federal government. That meant blending in, denim boots, flannel shirts, that sort of thing. We started by talking to the ranger's family, getting a feel for his habits, his routines. Standard procedure. It turns out he was an experienced outdoorsman. Hunted, fished, hiked those lands since he was a kid. Didn't seem like the type to get himself lost. We checked out the last place he was seen, a good seven-mile trek off the main road. Woods were dense, trails winding, and there was a chill in the air that told me autumn wasn't far off. I kept those eyes peeled, noting every broken branch, every disturbed patch of earth. If there was something unusual happening here, I aimed to find it. Days turned into nights. We heard the usual stories, whispers about skinwalkers, other things lurking in the shadows. But I'm the kind of guy who needs hard evidence. I wasn't exactly a skeptic, but the world I knew operated by certain rules. Rules didn't seem to apply out here, though. Then came the break we didn't quite want. A group of locals, teenagers from the sound of it, came stumbling into the sheriff's station. They were babbling, half out of their minds, talking about something they saw in the woods. Something that killed their friend. Now we were getting somewhere. We trekked back into those woods, the teenagers are reluctant guides. The deeper we went, the more the forest seemed to close in, like it resented our presence. Hair stood on the back of my neck, and it wasn't just the cold. Suddenly, the trees parted. We stepped into a clearing and froze. There, under the moonlight, was a sight I still see when I close my eyes. It was a carcass, mangled and torn like the work of a wild animal. But it wasn't a deer, or an elk, or anything I'd ever seen on a nature documentary. And this definitely wasn't animal work. We got a call for backup, Laura said, but the words felt hollow in the dead quiet of the clearing. That's when I saw it. Not fully, just a flicker of movement in the undergrowth. Then a pair of eyes gleamed in the darkness. They weren't the eyes of anything I recognized. I reached for my sidearm, and then the unthinkable happened. The creature charged. It was fast, impossibly fast. One second it was a shadow, the next it was barreling towards us. I heard shouts, felt the force of impact as the creature tackled me, sending me tumbling to the ground. The teenagers were scattering, screaming as the thing lashed out, its claws tearing through the air. It was on top of me. I could smell its breath, hot and foul. I managed to get my gun up, firing off shots. The creature screeched, recoiling but not injured. It circled, and there was an intelligence in its eyes, a predatory cunning that sent chills down my spine. Laura was there, her gun raised too. She fired, the shots ringing in the night. The creature lunged at her, claws raking her side. She cried out and fell but it turned back towards me. In the confusion, I got to my feet, aimed for center mass, and squeezed the trigger. The creature jerked and snarled. Its eyes blazed with fury. A wounded animal, but still dangerous. It crouched low, preparing to pounce again. I had maybe two bullets left. I closed my eyes for a split second, then fired. The impact sent the creature reeling back, a guttural howl tearing from its throat. But it didn't fall. It staggered, blood dripping from its wounds, but those eyes, they still held that terrifying hunger. Carter! Laura yelled, her voice strained with pain. She was scrambling away, bleeding badly from her side. The teenagers were long gone, vanished into the woods. We were on our own. There was no time for strategy. I holstered my gun and pulled my combat knife from its sheath. 
My heart pounded in my chest, and my hands were slick with sweat. This wasn't some interrogation room, some sting operation. This was survival, pure and raw. The creature stalked towards me, its movements jerky, injured. And then it did something unexpected. It dropped down on all fours, and for the first time, I saw it in its entirety. It was like a wolf, but wrong. Its body was too long, limbs twisted at odd angles. Its fur was matted, and in places, the skin was bare, revealing raw, pulsating muscle. The head, that was the worst part. Wolf-shaped, but the eyes were too large, almost human, and its teeth were long and jagged, dripping with saliva. It bared those teeth, let out another guttural snarl, and lunged again. I dodged, more by luck than skill. The creature crashed into a tree, sending splinters flying. Wood groaned in protest, and I saw the creature struggle, momentarily pinned to the trunk. My chance. I charged, knife raised. I wasn't aiming for a clean kill. This wasn't hunting. This was about buying time. I slammed the blade into its shoulder, notching bone. It shrieked, the sound piercing and unnatural. It clawed furiously at the knife, trying to wrench itself free. Laura called out, her voice weak. Over here! She was halfway back to the trees. I couldn't leave her, couldn't let her be this thing's next meal. With a desperate heave, I ripped the knife free, bringing a spray of foul-smelling blood. The creature whirled, fury etched into its monstrous face. I turned and ran. Laura was slumped against a tree, trying to hold her side with shaking hands. I knelt beside her, tearing strips from my flannel shirt to try and bandage the wound. Bad? She wheezed, her face pale. You're gonna be okay. I said, but I didn't sound convincing, even to myself. I scanned the darkness, listening for the sound of pursuit. Nothing yet. How, what was that? Laura shivered, whether from shock or blood loss, I couldn't tell. Don't know, I admitted, but we gotta move. We stumbled back towards the trail, Laura leaning heavily on me. Each crackle of a twig... Each rustle of leaves had me flinching, expecting those glowing eyes to emerge from the shadows. We made it to the edge of the woods, but the world still felt strange, off-kilter. Dawn was a faint glow on the horizon, and the forest behind us pulsed with a malevolent silence. The radio crackled in my pocket. Backup had finally arrived, and it felt like salvation. Medics rushed Laura to the waiting chopper, and the rest of the team started scouring the area. They'd find the clearing, the carcass, but they wouldn't find the creature. It knew those woods better than any human ever could. Laura didn't make it. We held a quiet service. The agency guys gave the usual platitudes, sacrifice, duty, that sort of thing. I stood next to her brother, the hollow words washing over me. They never did find out what that thing was. Some kind of cryptid, maybe. Locals claimed they'd always known the woods were no good after dark. The official report blamed her death on a bear attack, easier to swallow for the brass. I knew better. They offered to transfer me out of the division. I considered it. Spend my days behind a desk looking over files instead of whatever lurked in the shadows. But I couldn't shake the image of Laura in that clearing, her calling my name as the creature closed in. I requested my next assignment. Something international, they said, far away from Wyoming. I didn't argue. But wherever they send me, whatever cases I get embroiled in, I know this. Something changed out there, in those woods. The world got a little bigger, a lot darker. And there are things in it worse than any human enemy, things that the men in suits will never fully understand.
My name is Marcus Barnes, and this happened to me in 2008. I'm what you could call a troubleshooter for the CIA, although the organization would strongly deny it. My work takes me places you won't find on a map abandoned Soviet outposts, hidden jungle strongholds, deep cover infiltration in major cities. And sometimes, it takes me to sleepy corners of America where things aren't as normal as they seem. My wife jokes I have a knack for finding trouble. Maybe she's right. This all started with a missing persons case in the heart of Ozark National Forest, Arkansas. Small town, dense woods, and a strange pattern of disappearances that didn't make sense. Animal attacks were possible, but the lack of remains was unsettling. The locals muttered about old legends, things in the darkness, but I'm a facts-of-the-case type of guy. Hard evidence trumps tall tales. My partner for this gig was Sarah, a field biologist with a sharp mind and a healthy dose of skepticism that mirrored my own. We started like any investigation, talking to the town, hiking the established trails, checking out areas where folks vanished. The forest felt normal at first, sunlight dappling through leaves, birdsong filling the air. I dealt with enough jungle warfare and urban chaos to appreciate that slice of Americana, but Sarah was the one with the relevant expertise out here. She pointed out our breaks in vegetation, strange tracks unlike any coyote or bear I'd seen, and an unsettling lack of small game. Things should be louder. She commented one afternoon as we surveyed a particularly silent patch of woods. Then came the break a blurry image caught on a hunter's trail camera. It was misshapen, too lanky to be an ape, muzzle elongated like a dog, but wrong, with two wide eyes that reflected the flash. Sarah was stumped, and even I couldn't shake the feeling that we weren't dealing with your average predator. We decided on a nighttime stakeout. Not regulation, but when the normal rules don't explain things, you adjust. Sarah rigged some motion sensors and IR cameras while I prepped gear. Mostly non-lethal, but I always have a backup plan involving bullets. That came from hard experience. The forest transformed as darkness fell. Sounds amplified, rustling leaves, snapping twigs, and the shadows seemed to deepen, take on impossible shapes. We settled into position, backs against a tree trying to blend in. That's when I saw it. A flicker of movement in the undergrowth. I nudged Sarah, pointing, but it was gone. Then silence. Every instinct I had screamed wrong. You feel a predator's presence, even one you can't see. Perimeter sensor just tripped. Sarah whispered, her voice tense. Suddenly it was there. Not ten feet away, not the hulking monstrosity I'd half expected. It was streamlined, almost elegant in its awful way. Its body was wolfish, but hairless, skin-like stretched leather pulled over two sharp bones. Its eyes, those were what got to me, huge and luminous in the darkness, reflecting our own IR camera back at us. They held intelligence— a predatory hunger that chilled me to the core. My training kicked in. I reached for the tranquilizer gun, hoping to get a clean shot. Sarah aimed her camera, trying to get a better image of the thing. But we were too slow. With a speed that defied belief, the creature darted in. Sarah's camera was knocked flying, and then it was on her. I heard a shout— a feral snarl that wasn't quite animal, and then she was dragged backwards into the inky blackness. I fired the trank gun, heard a muted thump. The creature paused, turning its luminous eyes towards me. For one heart-stopping moment, we just stared at each other across the clearing. Then it lowered its head, bared its teeth, a forest of needle-sharp incisors, gleaming even in the dim light, and charged. 
I sprinted, hearing twigs snap, the creature's ragged breathing too close for comfort. My mind raced. Sarah? Was she dead already? Did I dare stop, try to help, knowing that meant becoming the thing's next target? The path blurred beneath my feet. Every instinct told me to keep running, reach the truck, get a bigger gun, come back prepared. But another part of me, the part that couldn't live with myself if I abandoned Sarah, made me veer off course, back into the heart of that damned forest. I stumbled, crashed through bushes, the creature's snarls hot in my ears and growing closer. I risked a look back and saw those eyes in pursuit, glowing like twin embers. And then, Sarah's voice, a scream cut short. Adrenaline spiked through me. I ran faster than I had any right to, every step a gamble. The creature was toying with her. I knew it, drawing out the hunt. Fury battled with cold, analytical logic. Focus was my only weapon now. Then I saw them, Sarah, slumped against a tree, the creature crouched beside her, sniffing her hair, testing her. I realized with a jolt, it wasn't feeding yet. Sarah was still alive. My chance. A gamble, but everything was at this point. I stopped, raising my hands, trying to look non-threatening, a ridiculous gesture, given the circumstances. Hey! I called out, my voice steady despite the terror pounding in my chest. Come after me, you ugly bastard! For a split second, the creature hesitated. Its head tilted, those horrifying eyes assessing me. Then with a snarl, it abandoned Sarah and turned on me. It moved like a shadow given form, like something born from nightmare fuel. But I was ready. I sprinted sideways, not towards the truck, but deeper into the woods. Every twist and turn of this terrain, I knew it from our recon. The creature was fast, but I was banking on something else. A stream. I'd seen it on the map, a swift, rocky bottom channel just a few hundred yards from our last position. My plan, flimsy as it was, hinged on getting there first. I risked another glance back and saw the creature lunging for the space I'd just been, its claws slashing empty air. A surge of hope, however desperate. Maybe I could outmaneuver it. I hit the stream with a splash that sent water spraying. The current was stronger than I expected, the rocks slick beneath my boots. I stumbled cursing, feeling clumsy compared to the fluid, sure movements of the thing pursuing me. I splashed across to the far bank, knowing that momentary delay bought me seconds, but seconds were all I had. The creature hesitated on the opposite shore. It sniffed the air, ears twitching, then paced along the river bank, looking for another crossing point. That was the crux of it, water. Sarah had mentioned something about its tracks not going near wet ground. Was this some vulnerability I could exploit? Was it why it hadn't killed her outright? I didn't have time to analyze, just react. I ran downstream. The current tried to tug me, but I kept my footing, scrambling along the bank. I could hear the creature paralleling me, its growls echoing through the trees. Up ahead, a bend in the stream, and my last desperate hope a fallen log spanning the water, creating a natural bridge. If I could cross that first. I pushed myself harder, fueled by fear and guilt and a burning need to give Sarah even a slim chance. The log came into view, rotting, covered in moss, but it had to hold my weight for a few precious seconds. I didn't break stride, leaping onto its slippery surface, feeling it groan beneath me. I heard a splash. The creature had found another crossing point upstream. Now it was a race. I ran across the log, the rushing water a blur below me. On the far side, I whirled, 
raising the trank gun. The creature emerged from the trees with a snarl, eyes blazing. I fired a shot, two. One hit its shoulder, the other its flank. I didn't wait to see the effect. I turned and ran, crashing back into the dense cover of the forest. Behind me, a roar of pain echoed, then silence. Had I slowed it down? Bought time? I didn't dare hope. I kept running, my lungs burning, legs threatening to give out. Only when the first fingers of dawn reached through the trees did I risk slowing down. I stumbled back to the truck, retrieved the satellite phone, and called for backup. It took hours for the team to arrive. They found Sarah first. She was alive, miraculously, but badly injured. Claw wounds, broken bones, and a concussion from being dragged. Something had played with her, tormented her. They found the creature, too. The trank darts hit home, but just slowed it down. It died near the stream, its snarling muzzle frozen in a rictus of rage. The biologists were baffled. They'd never seen anything like it, a predator perfectly evolved for this environment, yet eerily out of place, like something stepped out of the wrong evolutionary path. The incident was hushed up. Disappearance reports were altered, injuries blamed on bear attacks, the creature's body incinerated. The agency cleaned up the mess, as they always do. I saw Sarah through recovery. She didn't want to talk about it. Some horrors are better left unspoken. She left the field, moved out west, trying to rebuild her life. As for me, I asked for a reassignment. Got myself stationed on a remote outpost near the Arctic Circle. Cold suits me. It's simple. The enemies here are human, predictable. But at night, lying in my bunk, listening to the howling wind, sometimes I see those eyes glowing in the darkness. I wonder if the creature was one of a kind, or if there are others out there lurking in the forgotten corners of the world. And I wonder, will they ever find me again? My name is Alex Thorne, and this happened to me in 2003. I was stationed in a remote corner of the Alaskan wilderness back then. Officially, I monitored seismic activity for the USGS. Unofficially, my job was listening for nuclear tests, troop movements, anything out of the ordinary in that vast, frozen expanse. Mostly it was dull routine, punctuated by supply drops and the occasional moose sighting. Then, one crisp October morning, everything changed. I married late, never the family type. That's probably why they stuck me out here. But even I felt a pang of loneliness walking into the cabin that morning and finding the radio dead. At first, I chalked it up to a solar flare, some minor glitch. I tried resetting the equipment, fiddled with the antenna alignment, nothing. Frustration turned to unease. Protocol demanded I report any technical issues immediately, but with the radio out. Well, that's when I saw the footprints. They appeared out of nowhere, a single line leading away from the cabin into the trees. Fresh snow had fallen overnight, making the tracks stand out in stark relief against the pristine white landscape. They weren't human, too large for any person. Now, I'd heard the local stories' tales of giant bears, creatures out of legend. But I never quite believed them. Yet there those footprints were. Curiosity, more than fear, propelled me forward. I grabbed my rifle from the rack, more for reassurance than anything else, and followed the tracks Alaska transforms you. It strips away the layers of city dweller, leaving you raw, alert. I moved with a practiced silence, senses reaching out into the quiet. The tracks led deeper into the woods, 
winding between pines and stands of birch. Every so often, I'd spot a splatter of red, too vivid against the snow to be anything natural. My grip on the rifle tightened. Something was hurt, possibly badly injured. Whatever made those tracks, it was a predator. I started seeing other disturbances, overturned rocks, broken branches, signs of a struggle. Then the trees opened out and the tracks disappeared. Before me lay a small clearing, and in its center, carnage. The carcass of an elk, half-devoured, ribs exposed to the indifferent sky. And around it, more of those impossible footprints. I approached cautiously, rifle raised, trying to piece together the scene. Whatever did this wasn't after a tidy meal. The carcass was mangled torn open with a ferocity that sent a shiver down my spine. There were gashes on the half-frozen hide that didn't look like the work of any claws or teeth I knew. While examining the scene, I almost missed it, that flicker of movement at the edge of the clearing. I whirled around, rifle raised, and saw it. Not the hulking beast I half expected. Instead, it was lean, with a long, sinuous body that seemed oddly boneless. The fur, mottled gray and brown, clung to wet-looking skin that stretched too tightly over its powerful frame. Its head was wrong, triangular, with a blunt snout, all teeth and predatory eyes. Those eyes met mine, a cold intelligence glinting in their depths. Neither bear, nor wolf, nor anything from the textbooks. I froze. Adrenaline surged through me. Every survival instinct trained into me by the CIA screamed at me to run, to shoot. Instead, I did something almost incomprehensibly stupid. I reached for my camera. I have that picture still, tucked away in a safe where top-secret files used to be. It's blurry, taken with shaking hands. But the creature is clear enough its head raised, a low growl rumbling from deep within its chest. A twig snapped behind me. I turned, rifle swinging up. A man stood at the edge of the clearing, dressed in furs, weathered face unreadable. In his hands was a crude, homemade spear. He stared at the creature, then at me, and lowered his weapon slightly. In a voice thick with a Russian accent, he said, they have come back. His English was broken, limited. We managed a stilted conversation. His name was Victor, a trapper who lived a solitary existence deep in these woods. He knew of the creature, of others like it. Apparently, these sightings had increased recently. The locals whispered of an ancient legend reawakened, a creature banished long ago, now returned. Whether it was superstition or some monstrous flesh-and-blood reality, I couldn't be sure. This much was clear, though. Something was out there, something dangerous, and its hunting ground included my little corner of nowhere. The rest of that day is a haze in my memory. Victor helped me drag the remains of the elk back to my cabin. He refused to enter, communicating with a mix of grunts and gestures. Before he retreated back into the trees, he pointed towards the carcass, then at the creature's retreating form. He mimed an explosion with his hands, and gave me a grave look. I understood the gist. This was more than a lone predator. It was something different, a potential ecological disaster unfolding in my quiet corner of the world. When I finally got the radio working, a mysteriously loose wire was the culprit. My report to HQ was met with the usual mix of disbelief and demands for proof. I sent the photo, knowing it wouldn't be enough. That should have been the end of it, but it wasn't. A supply drop was due in three days. The pilot, an easygoing guy named Carl, joked that the only danger out here was dying of boredom. The day of the drop dawned clear and freezing. I spent the morning nervously checking equipment, 
trying to ignore the prickle of unease down my spine. Carl's plane buzzed in right on schedule, circled once, waggled its wings. Just another day in the Alaskan wilderness. I marked the cleared landing area, anticipating the influx of supplies, the brief contact with the outside world. Carl never landed. I saw the flicker in the trees first. Then his scream, cut off midward, echoed through the stillness. I ran towards the source of the sound, rifle in hand, my mind racing. Too late. There was nothing left but blood in the snow and a trail of footprints leading back into the woods. I went numb. I radioed HQ, my voice flat, reporting what happened to Carl. They promised a full investigation team in a matter of days. Days. That night I didn't sleep. I sat with the lights on, rifle across my lap, staring at the door. Every rustle of wind, every creak of the cabin was the creature, coming for me. Help arrived, but it wasn't enough. Two grizzled agents in parkas, and a wildlife biologist named Dr. Jensen, a woman with sharp eyes and skepticism etched on her face. They took my statement, examined the remains of the elk, tracked the footprints. Jensen argued it was a bear, a mutated one, maybe. The agents muttered about animal attacks and me cracking under the isolation. That evening, they made camp near the edge of the clearing. I stayed in the cabin, ostensibly the safest place, but it felt like a trap. Jensen came by before nightfall, dropping off a powerful tranquilizer rifle. Just in case, she said, but her tone implied she thought I was losing my grip on reality. Darkness fell like a curtain. They'd strung motion sensor lights around their camp. I sat in my darkened cabin, staring out the window at the glowing ring that was their only defense. Then the first light flickered off. I heard a shout, a roar of inhuman fury. The second light went dark, and then the third. Gunshots rang out, echoing in the silence. The gunfire stopped abruptly. A terrible, keening cry rang out, echoing through the trees. Then, nothing but the soft whisper of falling snow. I waited, heart pounding. Had it retreated? Were they alive? Sunrise seemed an eternity away. When the first light of dawn crept over the horizon, I forced myself outside. The camp was a scene of devastation. Blood stained the trampled snow. Sleeping bags were torn open, supplies scattered. There were more of those footprints and drag marks, but no bodies. The search proved futile. They vanished without a trace like Carl before them. I was the only one left. HQ finally took me seriously. They sent more men, tactical teams armed to the teeth. They hunted through those woods, set traps, analyzed scat, even brought in thermal drones. Found nothing. The creature was a ghost, leaving behind only death and unanswered questions. They wanted me to stay, help them understand— but I couldn't. Alaska would always be that place now, the place where unseen horrors lurked, where people vanished in the blink of an eye. I took a desk job, pushing papers in a secure facility on the mainland. It's safer this way, they tell me. Safer, maybe, but not the same. Sometimes, when the wind whispers through the air conditioning vents, I imagine it's the rustle of leaves in the Alaskan forest. And sometimes, I dream of the clearing, and footprints in the snow, and the cold, intelligent eyes of a creature born from nightmares. The story doesn't end neatly. Some mysteries refuse to be contained within the pages of a report. I tried to forget. Tried to convince myself it was mass hysteria, a trick of the mind in that lonely place. But the photo is still there, and the memory still flickers. They say those who work in the shadows walk a fine line between what's real and what isn't. 
That day in Alaska, I crossed that line, and I never fully found my way back. My name is Nathan Bishop, and this happened to me in 1996. I'm a field agent for the CIA, the kind that gets sent to the places you won't find on any tourist map. My wife likes to say that I have a knack for finding trouble. Maybe she's right. This all started with a routine surveillance job down in the Louisiana bayou. Let me tell you, there's nowhere quite like the bayou. The thick, humid air, the buzzing of insects, the ancient cypress trees dripping with moss. It's easy to get lost out there, not just physically, but in the sense of timelessness, like you've stepped back centuries. Makes the day-to-day -day worries and politics seem strangely distant. Turns out, that isolation was exactly what our target needed. Supposedly, a cartel was using a remote section of swampland to smuggle something across the Mexican border. My job was simple, observe, report, don't get involved. Standard covert stuff. I rented a decrepit houseboat, stocked it with supplies, and settled into the sticky, claustrophobic routine of surveillance. Days blurred together. I watched locals fishing for catfish, tourists zipping through on airboats, and birds flitting between the gnarled tree branches. Nights were eerier, alive with strange calls and the glow of fireflies against the inky darkness. It was classic CIA tedium, the kind that can drive you a little crazy if you let it. Then, three weeks in, I saw them. It was just past midnight. I'd woken with that sense of wrongness you develop after years in this line of work. Something in the air felt off. I slipped the night vision binoculars over my eyes and scanned the swamp. That's when I spotted movement, figures slipping through the trees like shadows. Five of them, carrying crates. Their boat was unlike anything I'd seen in the bayou before, sleek, black, almost futuristic. They vanished into a tangle of mangroves at the water's edge. My instincts told me to keep my distance, radio for backup, follow protocol. But I made a different choice. Blame it on the isolation, the weeks of monotony, or just plain curiosity that got the better of me. I decided to follow them. Ghosting in their wake, I kept a safe distance. The houseboat creaked ominously, and mosquitoes whined in my ears. I slapped at them heart pounding, trying not to make a sound. The men moved with practiced stealth. They came to a stop at a partially sunken shack, half submerged in the brackish water. One man pulled the device from his pocket some sort of key fob and pressed a button. With a rumble, a section of the marsh floor slid open, revealing a hidden tunnel. The men disappeared down the passage, crates in hand. My mind raced. What the hell was going on? Drugs? Weapons? Something more sinister? I had zero authorization to do anything but watch. But now, now it felt personal. I inched the houseboat closer and secured it to an overhanging branch. Then, taking only my sidearm, I followed the men into the tunnel. It was surprisingly well constructed with dull metal walls and dim lighting at intervals. The air smelled stale, recycled. My heart pounded harder than it had any right to. This was way, way outside my job description. The tunnel twisted downwards, deeper than I expected. Up ahead, I heard voices, echoing faintly. I risked moving closer, keeping to the shadows. The tunnel opened into a cavern, and what I saw made me stop dead in my tracks. It was a laboratory. State-of-the-art equipment gleamed under fluorescent lights. Men in biohazard suits worked at glowing consoles. And in the center of the room, 
housed in glass tanks filled with a bubbling liquid, were creatures. I'd seen a lot of the world's darkness, but this was something else entirely. They were humanoid, but wrong. Skin stretched too tight over sharp bones, eyes too large and luminous. The creatures twisted in their tanks, slamming scaled hands against the glass. There were experiments happening here, perversions of nature. Beside one tank stood one of the cartel guys I'd been tracking. He was talking to a tall figure in a pristine white lab coat. All I could see of the man was his back, but there was an air of authority about him. The cartel guy gestured at the creatures, said something about test subjects, a breakthrough. The man in the lab coat didn't turn around, but his voice sent a chill down my spine, smooth, cultured with a strange accent I couldn't place. Unfortunate, but a necessary sacrifice for progress, was all he said. Before I could process this, one of the creatures in the tank let out an ear-splitting shriek. My breath caught in my throat. The shriek echoed through the cavern, reverberating off the metal walls. In the tanks, the other creatures stirred, thrashing violently. The men in biohazard suits started shouting, alarms blared, and I knew it was time to go. I backed away, heart thundering. Get out. Report back. That was the smart move, the only move. But then I thought of those creatures, the cartel's connection, whatever experiments were happening down here, and a reckless anger surged through me. I couldn't just leave. Not this time. I palmed my sidearm and moved deeper into the facility, sticking to the shadows. My plan, such as it was, hinged on creating a distraction, something to buy me time to plant the remote detonator I'd brought for emergencies, way, way out of protocol emergencies. I saw my chance near a supply room. I crept closer, overturned a crate filled with vials, sending glass shattering across the floor. Shouts erupted as guards ran to investigate. Seizing the moment, I sprinted towards what looked like a central control room. Adrenaline pumped in my veins. It had probably been twenty years since I'd moved with this kind of speed and reckless abandon. The control room was full of blinking monitors, too complex to decode at a glance. I slapped the detonator onto the main console, setting the timer for five minutes. I should have retreated immediately but curiosity snagged me. On one monitor, I saw security footage of the cavern with the creatures. They were out of their tanks, clawing at the men in biohazard suits. Blood splattered the screen. Pure chaos. Behind me, there was a noise. I whirled gun raised. The man in the lab coat stood in the doorway, the strange accent even thicker in his words. CIA? How disappointing. He wasn't alone. Two cartel thugs bracketed him, weapons trained on me. I cursed myself. Walked right into a trap. You stumble upon something truly groundbreaking. He gestured vaguely around the room. And all you can think of is destroying it. There was a fanaticism in his eyes, an intensity that bordered on madness. This, he swept an arm dramatically towards the monitors showcasing the bloody carnage, is evolution, the future of mankind. Something clicked in my head then. It wasn't drugs those guys were smuggling, not weapons. This was about something far more insidious, the manipulation of life itself, and for what purpose? Power? Profit? Some mad scientist delusion? Whatever it was, it scared the hell out of me. The cartel guys closed in. I didn't have time to think. I squeezed the trigger twice, the gunshots deafening in the enclosed space. One of the thugs staggered, clutching his shoulder. Before they could recover, I bolted for the exit. 
warning alarms screamed behind me. The race back to the tunnel was a blur of shouts and gunfire. At one point, I took a bullet in the arm, the burning pain momentarily staggering me. I gritted my teeth, kept running. I reached the tunnel saw the dull green glow of the rising sun on the fetid water, and knew salvation was tantalizingly close. Then, it emerged behind me. From the darkness of the tunnel, a clawed hand ripped through the water, pulling itself forward. One of the creatures, impossibly fast, impossibly free. Its luminous eyes fixed on me, and a guttural snarl rose from its throat. I fumbled for the detonator, finger trembling on the button. The creature lunged from the tunnel, landing with a splash that sent water spraying. Behind it, more eyes gleamed in the darkness. I hit the button. The explosion ripped through the cavern. Flames roared outwards, engulfing the creature, searing the walls of the tunnel. The ground beneath me shuddered violently and I was thrown into the murky water. I floundered to the surface, coughing, vision blurry. Behind me, the tunnel collapsed, burying everything. The houseboat was still where I left it. I dragged myself on board, numbly patching up my wounded arm. Then, I started the engine and steered out of that damned swamp, not stopping until I was miles away. When I finally radioed for extraction, my report was unconventional. The words genetic experimentation and non-human entities don't go down smoothly in a CIA briefing room. The brass wanted evidence, proof, and all I had was my word, my wounds, and a half-sunken wreck in the middle of a Louisiana bayou. They called it compromised judgment, stress-induced hallucination, gave me a mandatory psych eval and desk duty for six months. Officially, nothing happened down in that swamp. But at night, when I lie awake, I still see those eyes burning in the darkness, smell the acrid stench of that lab, and hear the splash of something inhuman emerging from the water. The worst part is the certainty that this wasn't an isolated incident. Somewhere out there, Men like the one in the lab coat continue their unholy work. And whatever they've unleashed into the world, it's still out there. My name is Jason Cole, and this happened to me on October 12, 2003. I was working as a CIA field agent and it was, well, let's just say it was the day I learned not everything can be explained. I worked in a very specialized division of the CIA. Not many people even know it exists. We investigate the strange, the fringe stuff the other divisions don't touch. Cryptids, urban legends, things like that. Most of the time it's debunking hoaxes, and I like that. People deserve to know the truth. This particular assignment took me to the Black Hills National Forest in South Dakota. A string of disappearances caught our attention. Hikers and campers vanishing, nothing left behind. Standard Bigfoot stuff on the surface, but the disappearances were too frequent, too concentrated in one area. My partner on this case was Samantha Hayes. Smart, resourceful, total skeptic, just like me. We hit the local ranger station first. Standard procedure. The head ranger, an old Native American guy named Dennis Wounded Bear, listened to us with that stoic face I'd seen on a dozen reservations. You'll find no answers in those hills, Dennis finally said. His voice was deep, with a hint of warning. That place... It has its old ways. Look, we just need a point of reference dash, Samantha began, but Dennis held up a hand. I will tell you this. Many names have been given to what dwells there. Your people might call it Bigfoot or Sasquatch. 
Our people have a different word. He paused, and even my ingrained skepticism couldn't fight a shiver. The Ectomi? We stared. Like the trickster spirit? Sam asked, more incredulous than afraid. Dennis nodded. Not the stories you tell children. The real Ectomi. Powerful. Dangerous. And you think this thing is responsible for the missing persons? I said, because sometimes you need to just state the ridiculous to make sense of it. Dennis shrugged. Only you can find that answer. But go with this warning. The Ectomi does not like to be found. That night... Over instant coffee in our dinky motel, Sam and I did what we always did, tore down every possible explanation. Animal attack? Too clean, too many disappearances. Serial killer? Too remote. Then it hit me. What if, what if people are leaving willingly? What if it ain't kidnapping, but recruitment? Sam looked at me. A frown wrinkling between her eyebrows, then slowly nodded. Cult activity made a twisted kind of sense. The next morning, armed and with the ranger's vague directions, we headed into the woods. We spent most of the day finding nothing but trees, the occasional startled deer, and our own echoing footsteps. Just as frustration began to set in, something moved off trail. A low, guttural sound, a growl but far too deep for any animal I knew. We both turned, weapons raised. The trees were dense here, old growth. The growl came again, and there, just a flash of movement between the trunks. Did you see that? Sam whispered, tension making her voice high. I nodded. Too big for a man, and it moved too damn fast. A sudden, primal fear gripped me then. This place felt wrong. The quiet was wrong, the way the sunlight didn't quite penetrate the leaves. There was a sense of being watched, of being judged. We need to get back. I started, and the world seemed to tilt sideways. The ground erupted beneath our feet. Fountains of dirt sprayed into the air, and something huge— impossibly huge, lunged from the pit. Samantha screamed, just a choked cry cut short, and then she was gone, swallowed whole by the earth as if she never existed. I was thrown clear, landing hard. Shock froze me for a heartbeat, and then I was scrambling back, gun raised and useless. The creature. I couldn't even call it the Ectomi. This thing was more than any myth. It stood at least ten feet tall, a massive humanoid shape, but hunched, all sinewy muscle and coarse, dark fur. Its head was wolf-like but stretched to monstrous proportions, and its eyes, the eyes glowed with a yellow light that hurt the brain to look at. A scream tore from my own throat then, part terror, part defiance. I fired, unloading the entire clip into the beast. The bullets hit, I saw them sink into its flesh, and it didn't even flinch. It cocked its head at me, a predator contemplating its prey. Its maw opened, impossibly wide, and from inside the sound came. Not a roar, not a growl, but a buzzing of a thousand insects that seemed to crawl beneath my skin. I turned and ran. It didn't give chase, that was almost worse. It watched me leave like I was nothing, insignificant. I ran until my lungs burned, until I stumbled out of the woods at dusk and collapsed at the feet of a terrified forest ranger. When they finally carted me out of those woods, I told them an animal attack, bear most likely. I told them Samantha fell in a sinkhole and they couldn't find the body. The lies were for my benefit more than theirs. Even back in the sterile hallways of the CIA, the memory wouldn't fade. The eyes in the dark. The sound that still echoed in nightmares. And somewhere, back in the Black Hills, the Ectomi waits. The trickster, the stealer, 
the thing that makes men disappear. And I'm starting to suspect. It likes the taste of skeptics.